It is Tuesday, August 18th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps and steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, distinguished professor of English from the Brooklyn College City University of New York, Eric Alterman will be here on his new book, Lying in State, Why Presidents Lie and Why Trump is Worse. Also on the program today, Democratic National Convention Night One, light on policy and progressives, but does maybe achieve swaying John Kasich's family to vote for Joe Biden. Also on the program today, Tom Perez looks to eliminate Democratic caucuses. New report, scientists see lasting COVID immunity. That's good. DHS rejects the GAO's finding that Wolf and Cuccinelli are serving illegally. GOP begins to crack over the postal attacks. The joy to testify while his Senate patronage keeps some of those senators mum. Richie Neal tarnished by revelations that Massachusetts Democrats tried to hide their tracks in the Morse smear. State sue oxy manufacturer Purdue for $2.2 trillion. And speaking of which, 12 billionaires now own more than $1 trillion in wealth. Meanwhile, names are released for the Republican convention. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, you thought things were weird last night. It's going to be a doozy. Donald Trump. Pardons Susan B. Anthony today because she's getting really big. It's also the anniversary of women's uh, suffrage. And lastly, Andrew Cuomo to release a COVID leadership book. Possible working title, history shall not absolve me. All this and more on today's program. Uh, Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, we had a little technical difficulties at the beginning of this. Uh, so we got to move a little quick so that we can get to Professor Altman. Uh, just a, a little programming note. Oh, well, two things I want to say. One is, please don't call into the uh, show uh, prior to my uh, taking phone calls. Because then we have people on the phone for literally an hour and a half, uh, you know, before an hour before we go into the show. It's very costly to have 20 people on the uh, Twilio. Like, literally, we have to recharge it during the course of the show. So don't call in until the second half of the show, or if I explicitly say it's time for calls, please, please, um, uh, please help us out with that. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, also uh, want to remind you, what do I got this here? Where is, oh, here we go. Oh, uh, remind you a lot. We got uh, great uh, rave reviews about Nomi's um, um, uh, pre-convention show to my, yesterday, I should say, with, with Thomas Frank. I'm going to go back and look at that because I didn't have a chance to do it in the afternoon. But uh, today at 3 p.m. on uh, the Nomiki show, and you can, um, you can find that on patreon.com, Nomiki uh, show or on youtube.com, the Nomi Key show. And you got John Nichols 
And then uh, as our special guest, and then a panel with Larry Cohen, who was the uh, chair of our revolution, uh, former Bernie chair, a former uh, president of the um, uh, CWA union, and uh, Jane Klebe, who is uh, chair of the Nebraska Democratic Party, and um, Brent Wilder, a DNC rules member. So um, the um, check that out, 3 p.m., uh, Nomi Show. I don't know. She had a good audience for that yesterday. So uh, check it out. Um, meantime, let me do uh, one uh, read right now, if I could. As you know, we're home more than usual these days. You still got to keep a close eye on things. More deliveries means more boxes left unintended. More opportunities for packages to go missing. It happens, ladies and gentlemen. With Ring, you can keep your home safe no matter where you are. Ring gives you a protection at every corner. They got video doorbells that let you answer the door and check in on your home at any time. You can keep an eye on your doorstep or you can speak to delivery people when you can't come to the door. And they got outdoor security cameras. You can check on every part of your house. Never miss a moment. Smart lighting brightens up your blind spots. Make sure you can always come home to a brightly lit house. Uh, you want to watch on your pets? You can watch your pets. All sorts of different types of home security. Uh, and these they have full home security systems that give you everything you need to protect your family. Like I say, your pets, your property, whatnot. The thing that they got that I that I have not seen any other company has that has this that I think is amazing. And I'm giving it to my buddy so we can watch uh, some animals in his backyard is a uh, solar panel attached to the camera. Because one of the problems that you have when you have remote cameras is that the battery runs out. Solar power takes care of all that. But they also ring also has these great floodlights that also uh, turn on when you um, so they function both as floodlights and as video cameras. Nice to have security. Also fun, fun to watch. You can get a special offer on the Ring Welcome Kit when you go to ring.com slash majority. The Welcome Kit includes the Ring Video Doorbell, the Ring Video Doorbell number three, and the Chime Pro. It's all you need to start building a custom security for your home today. This is the way to go, folks. Also helpful um, if you're just making sure that maybe you, have, you are someone who is responsible for an elderly mom or an elderly dad. If that happens, I can tell you. Uh, very helpful. Just go to ring.com slash majority. That's ring.com slash majority. Also, um, very uh, few uh, silver lines I can find during this whole uh, pandemic uh, period. But it has given uh, me an opportunity to spend some quality time with some of my family members. Specifically, I'm talking my daughter. And where do we do it? <laughs> she was obsessed with uh, those, what are those Dick Wolf shows? Law and Order. So uh, we started playing Hunt a Killer. It's a new way to do game night. Gives, uh, gives everybody the opportunity to have fun, work together, investigate a crime without even having to leave the house. Hunt and Giller reinvents the way that we interact with murder mysteries. You go from being a viewer, safe, watching the tube, boob tube, to an investigator who's actually involved in solving the case. It's a murder mystery subscription box. They send it to you uh, on a monthly basis. They have over 2,000 five-star review on Trustpilot. With each delivery, you sift through. They send you documents. They send you some audio recording evidence, or the other types of evidence, case files. You could build a map. You build the whole thing with the cue card, not a map, but with the uh, cue cards on your bulletin board. It's awesome. And if you so desire, you can join Hunter Killer's spoiler free online community. It has over 100,000 members so you can share theories and help each other out. That's what I do with my kid. And it keeps her off the tablets for about three minutes. Uh, that's been the best thing about it is that it's, it's just, it's a fun thing. It's a fun game to do. It's, it's sort of like it's, it's serialized. So you get, you know, you stick with one, uh, crime essentially, and then you solve it. And then you move on to the next one. It's like true detective, except you're the true detective. It's, it's really fun. Right now, for our listeners, you can go to hunttokiller.com slash majority. Use promo code majority at checkout for 20% off your first box. 
Head to huntakiller.com slash majority for 20% off. Show your support for our podcast. That's huntakiller.com slash majority. Let's play. Um, I want to play this clip because it's apropos to our next guest, uh, Eric Alterman, who has written now uh, multiple books on presidential lying. Here is Donald Trump. He's talking, well, <laughs> um, I don't know if this is directly a lie because we have another one that's a lie. Should we just do the Gallup poll one? Let's do, let's play this clip. Here's Donald Trump. Since we have uh, Eric Alterman on the program, we're going to bring him on in just a moment. He's written a book, Lying in State, Why Presidents Lie and Why Trump is Worse. This is part of it. The guy lies about everything and with a, a fluidity that is uh, pretty stunning. What clip number is this? This is seven. This is seven. This is Donald Trump. He's going around. I don't know. Giving people COVID, I guess. Um, um, but this is where is he in the White House here? Yes. OK, this is not when he was in Wisconsin. All right. So here he is. There's Donald Trump um, desperately trying to uh, justify his COVID response. Remember, for like a number of months, he refused to wear a mask uh, because it was uh, it would ruin his makeup or something. And then but prior to that, he was just denying that this thing was real. And here he is defending his COVID response by attacking Barack Obama with a poll that doesn't say what it says, what he says it says. Well, they got very bad reviews. If you look at the Gallup poll, Gallup poll did a review of them. Now, you have to understand that was a far lesser uh, vicious disease. It was not the same in the same ballpark. But let me, yeah, yeah, I know. Pause it's it also one second. The, the question they're asking is, um, um, w what about how people responded to Barack Obama versus yours? Go ahead. In the same ballpark. But let, yeah, yeah, I know. It's also a much lesser disease. But they got very bad reviews. Gallup gave very bad reviews. And by the way, Gallup at that same time gave us very, very good reviews for the job we've, we've done. So if you take a look at the Gallup poll from a couple of months ago, we got very good reviews and they got very bad reviews. They were, they were I mean, the reviews they got for the handling of swine flu or H1N1, which Biden calls N1H1, and I don't even correct him on that. I don't even correct him. I said, no, nah, that's a mistake uh, you can make, but uh, that's I what he calls did. it. He's got, the, he's got it a little mixed up, but that's all right. Take a look at the Gallup poll, and there were others too. They got horrible marks, and that disease is a much lesser problem. Okay. Mr. President, do you support protesters in Belarus, and do you have a message? Do I support protesters and terrorists? In Belarus. In Belarus. In Belarus. Oh, I thought you said protesters and terrorists. Yeah, with Belarus. <laughs> um, just for the record, I mean, of course, uh, Gallup showed at the time that 66% approved of the Obama administration's handling of H1N1, which is actually sort of stunning because I, I would imagine there was at least 40% of the country that would not give him approval on anything. And of course, uh, Trump cites uh, his Gallup poll from <laughs> three or four months ago, uh, but Gallup now shows only 36% approve of Trump's response to coronavirus. And the surveys reveal even other surveys reveal other, uh, even lower numbers. Uh, but Donald Trump is a, I don't know, maybe he's a pathological liar. That would be a great question to ask our next guest, the distinguished professor of English from Brooklyn College City, University of New York, the liberal media columnist for the nation and uh, author of over 10 books. Eric Alterman will be right with us with Lying in State, Why Presidents Lie and Why Trump is Worse.
We are back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program for I don't know how many times. I mean, he's been on the show uh, since since the the first, the very first iteration of the Majority Report over 15 years ago now. Uh, he is the distinguished professor of English, Brooklyn College City University of New York. He is the author of uh, over 10 books. Uh, and he is the liberal media columnist for the nation. His latest, Lying in State, Why Presidents Lie and Why Trump is Worse. Uh, Eric Alterman, uh, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Sam. It's a pleasure to speak to you again. Uh, now, I, Eric, let's just start with this. Um, we, I, I think probably the first time I interviewed you was probably about your book in 2004, which was When Presidents Lie, a History of Official Deception and Its Consequences. So the concept that Donald Trump would lie as president is not uh, is not necessarily uh, new. Why um, why revisit this topic? Why did I write this book? Yes, sir. I like that question. Um, I I went away with my daughter for my birthday in January 2017. My birthday is in January. And the weather was really bad where we were. And so I managed to get through all of Ron Chernow's eight or 900 page biography of the Warburg family. Which were oh, Eric. Eric, whatever you just did, we just lost you. Eric, are you there? Oh, gosh. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll try and figure this out. Be right back after this. All right, ladies and gentlemen, sorry about that. Um, so, Eric, my question to you was, having um, re uh, written When Presidents Lie, History of Official Deception and Its Consequences back in 04, when we probably first spoke, um, why, <clears throat> why, why revisit that topic? Yeah, well, I started to tell a long story. Did you really not get any of it? Well, I know that you. Uh, I know that you said that you went on vacation with your daughter for your birthday, which is in January. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, and you start to read a a. Uh, I'm still waiting for your present. From well, I'm I'm still trying to pick out something nice. Um, but you said that you started to read <laughs> a. Uh, you read a um uh, uh a biography. Yeah, of the Warburg family by Ron Chernow. And. The um, Warburg family were the wealthiest, after the Rothschilds, they were the wealthiest Jewish family in the world, I think, uh, certainly in Europe. They were German Jews. And the book was like 800 pages. And there's like at least 100 pages of the Warburg family telling themselves, Hitler's not going to be so bad. Uh, he's not as bad as he sounds. We can make it through this. Um, and of course, that turns out to be completely false. And uh, about half to a third of them 
were killed in the Holocaust. And um, I wasn't thinking that Donald Trump was Hitler. Uh, and certainly uh, the United States is not uh, Weimar and Nazi Germany. But I was thinking we're in a brand new situation. Uh, anything could happen. We have no idea how bad it will be. Our, and I did have the impression then, which I think has been confirmed, that our democratic institutions were much weaker than we assumed that they were, and that they could not withstand uh, much pushback. And I thought to myself, well, when I have uh, grandchildren someday, or when I'm on my deathbed, what will I say when people say, what did you try and do about Donald Trump? And I thought, well, lying in Paul, that my presidential line is something I know better than anybody else in the world, probably, because I did my dissertation on it and I wrote a four some four hundred page something book on it previously. Why don't I write a book about how Donald Trump fits in in the context of other presidential liars? So I went back to George Washington, which is very different than the book I published in 2004, and I looked at all presidents. I wrote a biography of every single one at the very least, um, and then I tried to put Trump's lying in context, and that. That's this book. So, <clears throat> you do you go through um, you go through um, uh, uh, lies that start with just I guess even uh, Jefferson in terms of um, uh, what I guess. I actually started watching at at a funny moment at a party uh, at Robert Carroll's house where I went up to Chernow and I said, you know, Washington lied because yeah, now I go shit. Oh, I'm sorry. Darn, I learned that from your book. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. All right, so so uh, you you start with uh, with 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 Washington. You go uh, Jefferson. You go uh, uh, through the ages of the the major lies that presidents tell. How would you categorize the? How is the lies that you know Roosevelt tells, or Truman tells, or Eisenhower, or Kennedy, or Johnson, or uh, Jefferson, and uh, Washington, um, Nixon? How are those lies? Well, I'm uh, how. What, what what are the what I guess what what's the taxonomy of these lies? Um, uh, well, how are they qualitatively actually, different? Stop there, stop there. Let me answer that question. Yes, sir. Uh, for the first hundred and fifty years or so of the country, they were first of all, all most politicians lie, and just like you can't get lies, you can't get money out of politics entirely. You can't get lies out of politics. It's a question of degree, and also it's a question of like depending on your society, what kind of lies are the kind of lies that are demanding? In the first 150 years of this country's history, there were two kinds of lies that presidents almost had to tell. It was very rare that they could get away without lying about these topics in one way or another. The first was white supremacy. The country built on white supremacy. It stuck with white supremacy up until, you know, the 1970s. In, in some ways, it's still does, and yet we have a we have a Declaration of Independence that says all men are created equal, and we teach our school children that all men and women are created equal, and yet we had slavery for a very long time. Black people weren't allowed to vote for a very long time. We treated the Native Americans as if they did not exist and wiped them out when they got in the way, uh, and so presidents had to lie about these about anything having to do with non-white people because it was just not consistent with the myth that presidents needed to, to mm -hmm. live by um, if they wanted to be in the mainstream American culture. Uh, the second lie, which is connected to the first lie, is a lie about first about expansion, then about empire, and thirdly about national security, although these are all the same thing. The, the United States started expanding immediately uh, upon its founding um, first under President Adams, enormously so under President Jefferson, and then again, just as enormously so under someone who doesn't get the credit for playing that he deserves for the effectiveness of the president, James K. Polk. And the country increased its, its uh, size by about a third under Jefferson, by about another quarter to a third under Polk. And then, uh, and they, they, they lied about it. In fact, there's a, the hero of the Polk story is actually Abraham Lincoln, who lost his, uh, who decided not to run for re-election because he was so dogged as a congressman for calling out Polk's lies. It's a great story. Um, and then, uh, around the turn of the century, 
uh, it became clear that that North America had no more room for American expansion. That's um, the great uh, article, the thesis by Fred, historian Frederick Jackson Turner about the end of the frontier. And at the same time, the country had adopted the ideology of manifest destiny, which meant that our Christian capitalist civilization was the best civilization in the world and we'd be doing everyone else in the world a favor if we helped them to see that, even if it meant killing them in order to impose it on them. So we started expanding overseas uh, in the Philippines, in Latin America, um, and we created an empire. But again, we, didn't, we weren't going to allow the non-white people in these places to become citizens, and we weren't going to give them a vote. Puerto Rico still doesn't uh, have senators. Um, so there were a lot of lies involved. First, over the fact that we were not behaving democratically, and second, over the fact that we were, in fact, creating an empire. When you get past the World War I and II into the Cold War, or after the Cold War, into the Cold War, then the empire becomes, uh, translates into the term national security. And so we start overthrowing governments left and right uh, and uh, denying rights at home uh, in order to protect our quote unquote national security when almost never is our actual national security as we would understand the terms of plain English ever threatened. It's about the Cold War and the need to protect our empire. And this, this uh, empire, national security has, and it has forced presidents to lie. Even presidents who hardly ever lie, Jimmy Carter, Barack Obama, still get caught up a little bit in that um, by telling things that they know are not true because the empire demands that. National security demands it. That was Bill Clinton, too, who, surprisingly, to me, and for maybe to your listeners, how do you lie at all? I mean, he certainly lied about not having sex with that one of Monica Lewinsky. But he, he was remarkably truthful with most uh, affairs uh -huh, having to do with presidency and stuff. All right, so Eric, let me let me just stop you for a minute and and just go back. Uh, so if if I mean, you, you say that there's a there's they're compelled to lie by uh, that the the requirements of empire, you know, uh, at least when we're talking, let's say that moves into national security and it becomes a little bit um, still empire, but it becomes a, just a slightly different um, uh, variant of it, I guess. Um, they're required to to lie because of there's, and I guess there's there's two different parts about this, right? Like one is the the compulsion. I mean, if Lincoln can call out Polk's lying, then it suggests that there's some wiggle room as to how compelled Polk was to have to lie, right? Because presumably Lincoln, even as a congressman, uh, is under s similar constraints as Polk. Correct. I mean, in terms of like, if they're doing this because they think it's for the best of the country. Well, that's quite a constraint. You know, I don't think there's been a single president that has convinced himself that it's necessary to do. Uh, you're breaking up a little bit, Eric. I'm sorry. You're breaking up a little bit. Um, Can you hear me now? Are you are you on a uh, on a cell phone? I'm on a cell phone, but I have a, I have a, a mic and I have a headset. Yeah, maybe the headset. Maybe try take the headset off. Sorry, folks. Is this any better? Oh my gosh, so much better, so oh, much better. Okay, you guys told me to put on the headphones. Well, uh, Brendan is in big trouble for that. Um, all right, so uh, uh, Eric, so okay, so I mean that that wh why is it that uh, Lincoln is not compelled to accept those lies and Polk is um, is. Lincoln decided that he'd rather get to the truth than be reelected. And he and his advisor said, don't do this. And he did it anyway, knowing that he would lose his seat if he did. And he did lose his seat. So if a politician's job is to win elections, then he did the wrong thing. All right. Fair enough. And, and that 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 na that nature of, of the lie that that Polk and others are talking about as a way of that is necessary to execute expansion and imperialism, right? That you need to completely deny the humanity of the people that you are conquering, killing, enslaving. Well, you need to say that you're actually doing them a favor. You know, 
it's the old line from Vietnam, we destroyed the village in order to save it. You actually say you're doing it for them, not for you. It's unselfish. So is this, this is, is this a also like, cause I'm just trying to set us up for what is in the maybe American psyche, maybe human psyche uh, that needs to have this sort of delusion uh, that, I mean, right. I mean, it wasn't that hard. I mean, maybe it was hard. I don't know. I mean, is it really that hard to sort of like, to, to, to realize that like, wait, wait a second, destroying the village to save it. That doesn't seem to make sense to me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I mean, is there just that much of a compulsion for, to, to be self deluded? Yes. I mean, look, everybody wants to think they're a good person and not, not everybody is. Uh, Sam, do you, are you a liar? Uh, I mean, of course. Of course. Okay. Well, most people, uh, I admire your honesty. But most people don't think of themselves as liars. They say, oh, every once in a while I might lie for good reason. But people lie all the time. Uh, I think men lie on average something like seven times a week, and women lie three, maybe four times a week. I do. I do um, closer to four. But go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, you have a strong feminine side. Thank you. But um, uh, women, by the way, this will be a shock that women lie to assuage people's feelings and men lie to build themselves up uh, on average. But um, anyway, uh, it, look, it's the job of the president to make the country feel good about itself, to make its citizens feel good about themselves. Nobody wants a president like, you know, Jim, Jimmy Carter was considered to be a scold because he talked about our, um, he didn't use the word malaise, but that's what he meant. Uh, and the president has to say, this is a good country. We're a good people. Every president says that. And, and yet, the empire demands that we do things that are morally indefensible on, on their face. And if you, you can have to say, in order for us to be good, we have to do things that are morally indefensible. Well, that's a kind of a complicated argument to make. Um, instead, you say, we're doing good things because we're good people and whatever we do is good. And that's an easy argument to make. And that's the argument that virtually all presidents have made. I think as far as anyone has gone, I remember I was at Bill Clinton's inauguration and he said, there's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed with by what's right with America. And that's about as far as a president I can think of going, saying that there's anything wrong with America at all until Trump, of course. Right. OK. And, and so so that takes us to Trump and um, his lying is is uh, like d- different in nature or different in um, I mean, the, his lying is qualitatively and quantitatively different. It is. Well, yes, well said. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on to it. Um, it's it's obviously quantitatively different because he's told according to the Washington Post, count uh, over 20,000 lies uh, in his first three years and a few months. I actually, uh, to be, uh, to be, to clarify a little bit, um, I like Daniel Dale's count better than the Washington Post. Daniel Dale, uh, I don't know if you, are you, do, you, do you follow his Twitter feed, Daniel Dale? No, I don't. Well, may I recommend that you do? Okay. It's the thing for us. I know of. Uh, Daniel Dell was hired away from the Toronto Star by CNN. And by the way, I've never even met this guy. I've never met this guy. I mean, I've, we've never spoken. I've never communicated with him. But um, he he does his own. He was hired just to cover uh, Trump's lies. That's what he's doing at Toronto Star. He does it all by himself, but he does it in context. He says, this is the three hundred time that Trump has told this lie. And because every time Trump says the word "sir," you know he's lying. Or the tell. Every time, I'm sorry, you're breaking up a little bit again. Words. Every time that uh, Trump says the word "sir," yeah, if, if Trump tells you a story and someone calling Trump "sir," that means Trump's making it up. Oh, so when in the story where someone addresses him as "sir," it's a, it's a, it's you, that's a tell of his you lie. You know, it's a lie. Yeah. That's just one of many, many, many examples. Um, anyway. Uh, point is, is that uh, there's no no one close to the 20,000 lies. Now, 20,000 falsehoods. Now, that's what gets us to the the qualitative difference. 
The qualitative difference is this. Of the presidents, take Lyndon Johnson as an example, who was also kind of a pathological liar in private life. Right? When he lied as president, he lied for the goal of trying to defend his Vietnam policy, which got off on the wrong foot when he found out that he had lied about um, the Dominic Gulf incident. And he had to keep lying and keep lying so that he wouldn't be humiliated and look like he was a tough guy and pretend that we were winning because we had never lost a war. He had good reasons to lie, even though they were in some degree no fault. He was lying to pursuit of a goal. Trump just lies. He just lies. No goal, no nothing. Everything is Vietnam is Trump, and everything is looking out just about as well as Vietnam is Trump. Um, the, the story that I find so curious is uh, Trump had a meeting with um, Justin Trudeau where they were discussing uh, America's uh, trade deficit with Canada, and Trump was bitching about it. And, and he said that we had a trade deficit, I don't know, in milk, or I forget the exact thing. And Trudeau said, no, we don't. And Trump said, yes, we did. And then, right. and then I'm Trump sorry, I'm sorry. The, the uh, Eric, I missed that. Uh, you, broke up, you broke up a little bit when you said, uh, Trump said that we have a what? Trade deficit. Right, okay. On some, on some product. Let's say it's milk. Anyway, the point is, is that right after Trump had his meeting with Trudeau, he went to the press and he said, I lied about this trade deficit. Like, what was the point of lying? In the meeting, if you're going to come out and say I lied, what is the point of Trump having a uh, a summit with all these European leaders that they've all attended, and then coming out in the press conference with all of them right there and lying about what was said and what was agreed to? He doesn't lie. He, the only reason he lies is because he wants to win the next minute, the top five minutes. He's all about the next five minutes. Other presidents have lied with a goal in mind. Even Nixon who lied about a lot of things. He was lying because he was trying to achieve some policy. And he, he probably knew what the policy was. He was lying, but he understood what he was lying for. Trump just lies and lies and lies and lies is with that, no particular purpose. Is that what and, we, is and that, he doesn't care that you know that he's a liar. Was it, is that what it, we it, call it, a, it, a pathological liar? Absolutely, he's pathological. But it works. He's, he has his Trump is a genius, and by genius I don't mean that he's raw intelligent, but he has this instinctive genius for how to manipulate the media, to drive them crazy, and to get him get them to report things on his terms, even though if you stop the reporter and say, "Wait a minute, does that make any sense at all?" They go, "No, that's not my job." So he's he's been able to control our discourse to an enormous degree at the same time, spouting nonsense nonstop. It's it's I never. Mean, I never would have been able to predict this when I when I saw. I mean, I, I watched Donald Trump as I'm sure you did, growing up. You know, he's been around forever. As uh, he's a little bit older than we are, and he, he he could never avoid the guy. And yet, I never would have suspected he could have been this successful with the nonsense that he peddles. It's phenomenal. It's a real indictment of our culture and, uh, and of our media. Um, do you, do you? Th I mean, you know, it's interesting. The the most insightful, I think. Um, um, uh, a, a thing I've read or, or just theory around Trump um, that I've seen, uh, you know, over the past four years, I guess. And I cannot remember her name, Matt, maybe you can remember, but she had written a book about, um, about mesmerism in this country. And the, mesmerism? what was it? Mesmerism. Yes. I never heard of it. Um, Matt, I, what was the name of the book? It was, it was, it was, it was about this the credulity in America where mesmerists would go around and, you know, basically, uh, lie to people and the, um, people would become enthralled because they felt like they were on the inside. They knew that they, that, uh, and, and she described, uh, it was credulity, a cultural history of U S mesmerism. And it's Emily Ogden. And wow, I wish I had known about this. Yes, you, you, you would enjoy this actually. And, and, and she, um, she made the point that, um, that the audience, they know that the, the guy is a liar, but they feel that they're on the right side of that lie, <laughs> that they, that that person is lying on their, you know, for, for their benefit or that they're in on the lie on some level. And so they're okay with it. They can't be hundred percent sure, but they, th that is why when we hear, you know, people say like, yes, he's, 
he's this, he's that, he's this and that. It's just that they feel that he has the ability to make it feel like he's doing it on their behalf. So when he comes back and says, I've lied to Justin Trudeau, it's now he's not lying because he thinks he's going to achieve anything other than make people feel like, yeah, good. He's, he's when, when, he, when, when Donald Trump lies to Justin Trudeau, it's like I lied to Justin Trudeau and look at me. I just, <laughs> I just lied to a Canadian prime minister and he bought it. You know, I think it's really just um, a question of power, right? I mean, it's just a question of in that moment, it is, it is Donald Trump showing that like, look what I can do. Doesn't matter if you think that I'm, 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 I, what, what I'm saying is true or not. It is a, an ex exhibition, an exertion of power in that moment. Uh, very interesting, Sam. Very interesting. Um, the way I address that question is from, you know, uh, you might recall in the introduction, I talk about four kinds of lies, um, misinformation, disinformation, uh, I'm sorry. Yes. You broke up again. Say, repeat that for mm -hmm. folks. You, you broke up. Sorry. Okay. There's four kinds of political presidential lies that I identify. Misinformation, where you just make a mistake. Disinformation, where you purposely tell people something that's false. Um, am I allowed to say uh, a curse yeah. word in the yes. philosophical yes. sense? Yes. On purpose? Yeah. Yes. So bullshit, in the philosophical sense, as defined by the Princeton University philosopher, Harry Frankfurt, is a lie where you just don't care what the truth is. You just say whatever you want because it's convenient. Um, Trump does all of these things. But the one that I learned about that I didn't know about, which is very interesting, which is relevant to what you're saying, is, is a philosophical term called the bald face lie. Sometimes they call it bold face. Um, but I think bald face is better. And a bald face lie is a lie where the person being lied to knows they're being lied to. And so it's not clear that you're trying to misinform or disinform them. You're in on it with them uh, as a kind of conspiracy. And therefore, uh, it's, the problem with bald face lies, you don't know if the person's in on it or not because people don't say, yes, I like being like, yes, I know it's a lie. They, they need to pretend to believe it. This is what Fox News is all about. It's one bald face lie after another, where sometimes the people know that they're being lied to and sometimes they don't. Like, you know, if you look at surveys of Republicans, well, most Republicans think you should wear a mask, but they like being told not to wear a mask and how masks are a communist plot by Anthony Fauci on Fox. Um, because, as you said, they, they like the power. They like sticking it to the lips. They, like, they, 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 they just like this guy. He's on their side. And so they're happy to hear his lies. It makes them feel good. And, but the problem is you can't tell what they believe and what they don't believe because no one will say, yes, I know he's lying. It's a, it's a real conundrum. And as I said, Trump does all of these things. I could, you give me an example, you know, ask me for examples. I could give you one for all of them. Bullshit is maybe the most common of them. But, um, but these bald-faced lies, the, the, the press doesn't know how to deal with them at all because they don't know if they should report them. They don't know. You know, the, there was a defender of Trump in the very beginning Campaign, I guess, uh, in the Atlantic, who wrote, uh, "Reporters pay too much to pay too much attention to what he actually says, whereas his supporters are listening to what he means." But nobody knows what he means, really, because it's all so contradictory and so crazy. But they know, at least in the, they think they know, that he's on their side. But he's not on their side because he's screwing them on behalf of billionaires and his friends. But Rhetorically, he's on their side. So, you know, it's, it's like the best example of this is evangelicals. He has contempt for evangelicals. That's why he screws porn stars when his wife just had a baby and stuff. He doesn't have an issue with them, but, but he's on their side politically, and he, he beats up the people that they want beat up, and he, he praises them. And so they think that he's on their side, and they stick by him. And well, is there anything you can say to that? I mean, he's, 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 he's changed their mind. He's on their side from a material standpoint. I don't know that they actually, I think, I think that they, I think their perspective towards politics is probably pretty good. I don't think they care what's in his heart so much as um, they have a, a narrative that explains that, you know, uh, God can send a, you know, a bad messenger to deliver a good message and he's doing it. And, and he, he okay. has done more for evangelicals probably than 
I don't know any modern president that I can that I can name. But 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 well, definitely. I mean, just just this morning he said it was it was he he was surprised that the evangelicals are much happier with his policies towards Israel than the Cubans. I got right that now. clip. That is that is stunning because that's that is the most truthful expression of the um, the the support for Israel in this country that I have heard by anybody not on a YouTube channel or, you know, a professor. Well, actually, you know, when I started this book, I put aside the book I was contracted to write, which is a history of the Israel-Palestine debate in the United States. And I'm back to writing it now. I've been working on it. Well, like I said, a professor, a professor, an esteemed (laughs) professor. But, but, you know, when, when, when I always want to get back to bald face lies because Okay. One of the scariest moments for me during the Trump uh, era, or the one that sticks out for me, was when Brett Kavanaugh was talking about, I mean, this is a, a very minor point about Brett Kavanaugh, but when he was in front of the uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee, and he was talking about what was written, and I, it, off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly what it was, uh, about a, a woman in his, uh, um, I, I guess, was it Renata or something? A woman, it, it, maybe it was in his yearbook or something like this. And it was clearly like a, a frat boy um, sort of, um, uh, you know, De, you know, uh, offensive, dehumanizing thing about this woman that he said was, oh yeah, Renati alumni or something. And he said it was an homage. And I just thought like every single person in that room knows that he's lying. His wife knows he's lying. His kids, his grown kids know he's lying. Every senator who's sitting on that panel knows he's lying. Every journalist in it. Every single person in that room knows he's lying about that. Nobody says a word. And that just struck me as like, that's the first, that's the first example we're seeing of someone specifically using Trump's skill sets to move forward. And, and I thought like, now the dam's open, we're going to see this everywhere. And, and we've seen it on, you know, maybe in some limited fashions, but that was the most explicit version of it. Like where everybody was like, Everybody in that room knew he was lying and nobody said a well, word. I think about we it. need to give credit to the Republican Party for empowering this kind of lying over a period of time. I mean, Ronald Reagan, Newt Gingrich, uh, and then, of course, the contemporary Democrat guys like, um, you know, the leader of the, of the uh, Senate. Uh, they have, they lie, sometimes they lie, but usually they just won't take a position on lying. I have a section in the book where their uh, leaders of the party are consistently asked whether or not Barack Obama was born in this country. They they read Trump's statements where he was doing his um, birther nonsense, and they won't say. They won't, the answer is, I'm not going to tell people what to believe. If they want to believe he was born in, in Kenya, more power to him. And so you ended up in an election where a majority of Republicans believe that Trump was born in Kenya. Where a significant minority of Republicans believe that Hillary Clinton was running a pedophile ring inside Comet Pizza in Washington. And if you add up these things, you get in a situation in which Hannah Arendt, writing about totalitarianism, said this is, a, this is what dictators aim for, where there's no such thing as facts. And you can get away with anything if, if there's no such thing as facts. I mean, really. Running a, a pedophile father, hundreds of millions of people believing that—it's uh, ridiculous. Uh, and yet, and yet, the, and yet, the, the media, for a variety of reasons, the, main, the members of the mainstream media are unable to deal with this level of nonsense. The thing that dawned on me—you had a—you had a what people call an aha moment with Kavanaugh. I had an aha moment watching the 2016 debates between Trump and Clinton, where. One of the questioners said to Trump, dude, do you really think that global warming is a plot by the Chinese to destroy America's manufacturing base? And Trump said, I never said that. I never said it repeatedly. I never said it. He said it hundreds of times. 
And it, it was right there, but he didn't care. And he was right not to care because he won the moment. He won the moment, and that's all that mattered. And, and he's won the moment after moment after moment after moment after moment. This is why, I'm sorry, I'm going on and on here, but no. this is why I think it's so important. This is why I like Daniel Dale better than the Washington Post. I'm fact-checking. We need, when Trump lies, when all politicians lie, we need the lie challenged at the time of the lie. We need our cable guys and, and our reporters to say this is false. Not there's no evidence for this or Democrats say maybe something different. This is false. It's not enough to say, oh, by the way, yesterday he did something that was false in a different story. But the lie lives on and on and on. It's not enough to tweet, oh, Trump said this, uh, and then later say uh, in the story somewhere it was false. They're, 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 they're participating in a destruction of our language and allowing, uh, I don't know what you call it, definitely authoritarianism, possibly neo-fascism to arise in the, in the midst of confusion. One thing that occurred to me as as to why the media was incapable uh, has been incapable, and, and you know maybe there's been some spotty uh, changes, like you say, but broadly speaking, incapable of 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 executing what you just suggested, was that there were lies that were far more respectable that I feel like the 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 press never questioned for years. I mean, just things like you know, um, like like like. Um, I don't know, Paul Ryan saying that, you know, or, 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 Don, or, or, or Ronald Reagan saying, you know, cut taxes will raise revenue, right? Like there's no, there was no evidence for that. We've seen perfect examples of where that has completely fallen on its face. Um, and uh, Paul Ryan could get out there and, 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 and say all sorts of just uh, ridiculous. I mean, it wasn't as like sort of absurd. It was just, there were, there were lies about things like the deficit and whatnot that people knew were lies. And uh, that were even less contentious than 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 global climate change, for that matter. But because they're said in a respectable manner, uh, they 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 weren't even remotely close to calling these things out. And and I guess my concern is that I have two part concern, and I and I know that at least uh, part of it is uh, you, you share this. Um, Donald Trump, fortunately, um, I mean. Knock on wood. Let's hope that he doesn't get reelected because then, then I think we're in a different sort of zone. But um, Donald Trump is also particularly incompetent. But there are, you know, there's like the the second mover advantage that people have, right? Like like Tom Cotton's looking at this and saying like, hmm, this I can get away with, that I can't. This I can get away with, that I can't. I mean, there's an opportunity here if Brett Kavanaugh can adopt that just sort of bald face lying. Um, I'm quite sure that others can too. And there's a second mover advantage um, that the next guy, probably a guy uh, who comes in with this attitude that the, the, that our body politic and our, and our, our, our society just does not know how to deal with this whatsoever. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, look, uh, read the conclusion of my book. There's the building blocks of an American form of fascism here. The democracy is probably not going to be able to survive a second term of Donald Trump. Um, it, it's proven weak in so many ways. We haven't, uh, as generous as you are with your time, we've only scratched the surface of all the different ways that Trump's lives have, have weakened our political system. And another four years of its assault, on, both on, on the system on a certain government, but also on the press itself, um, will mean, I think, the end of, of anything you can call democracy in this country. Uh, and uh, what does that mean, though? I, what does that what, I, is, what does that what? mean? What I mean, what does that mean? The end of democracy? I mean, what does that mean? Because I mean, it, you know, like I, 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 I'm trying to figure out where what it means, what it the, means is that we will have uh, the form of democracy with none of the content. If they're able to rig the elections through voter suppression and rig the census um, and, and, you know, screw up the, uh, whenever they need to, then most of the people in the country will be disenfranchised uh, because, you know, the, that's in part a function of the way our system is set up. And if most of the people in the country are disenfranchised and they have very little representation in Congress and in the courts, then the Republicans can do whatever they want to people. 
they could, you know, they've been, they've been, you know, they've been, we, we were upset when they were putting kids in cases and separating families, but they kept doing it. They got away with it. Um, and, and, uh, you know, when Puerto Rico had the hurricane, we were upset that Trump went over there and handed out paper towels, but nothing was done for these people because they, they don't vote for the Senate. They have no representation. And if they, when, if they vote in presidential elections, they vote democratic. We have Jared Kushner on record saying, let's not worry about the COVID in places that are run by Democrats because they'll be blamed. Well, this is, this is how all the entire government will be ruled with absolutely no concern for the good of the country. It'll just be to build the power of the individuals who are paying for it and supporting it. And by the time we're done, there'll be nothing left. There'll be nothing we can do. But what, but sure. let me ask you this. I mean, haven't we had voter disenfranchisement for the better part of our entire existence, right? I mean, up until 1965, we had a massive voter uh, disenfranchisement. Um, and well, we, we, we still have- the majority, wasn't, the majority wasn't disenfranchised. The minority was, number one. And number two, up, in, up until Ronald Reagan and Newt Gingrich and certainly Donald Trump, we had a relatively responsible elite that governed within rather narrow goalposts in terms of what was acceptable and what wasn't. And uh, it, it was very bad for people who were left out of the conversation, like um, black people. But uh, there, was, there was definitely a sense of limits. And, and you saw that with Nixon. Nixon could only go so far, and then he was forced to resign. Those limits have been removed. Trump is doing all kinds of things that would have been unthinkable in those years. So we're in far more danger now as a result of the voter disenfranchise than we ever were before. So is that, is that, is that the threshold for, for democracy when the majority of people are disenfranchised? I mean, I think it's, you know, arguable. I mean, you look at like a place like, you know, Wisconsin where um, uh, people vote for uh, Democrats in the state, the uh, state house, I don't know, 55 to 45. And yet uh, Republicans control 60% of the, the state house. Uh, you could argue that with the Senate too, right? I mean, uh, the federal Senate now. Yeah, that's what I meant. Structurally, we have a real problem, and we have a decidedly imperfect, uh, dysfunctional democracy, even when it works the way it's supposed to. That I wrote about this in that little book we once talked about, um, uh, Booty Democracy, the System versus Barack Obama, that, that we had elected a president who wanted to be aggressive, but the system could not contain that for all these reasons. Um, that's true, but I'm saying there's a tipping point, tipping into authoritarian slash fascism. I, I wasn't talking that way then. I, I was nervous to be talking about it when I wrote the book, but uh, since actually I finished the book in January, uh, it looks a lot. So that argument looks a lot stronger. Indeed. Well, uh, the book is uh, "Lying in State: Why Presidents Lie and Why Trump Is Worse." Uh, Eric Alterman. Always a pleasure. We will put a link to that book at majority.fm. Thank you so much, Sam. I always enjoy talking to you, and I'm, I'm here for you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Eric. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, folks, just want to um, apologize for the, the technical difficulties we had during there, but uh, interesting stuff, so I want to hang with it. Um, Alterman is a, a very um, uh, <clears throat> nimble thinker as it were, Dr. Altman. Um, longtime listeners will recall the time where uh, Janine Agarofalo and I were hosting the, the radio iteration of this show in, uh, at the Aspen Comedy Festival back in, <clears throat> I think it could have been 2004, maybe 2005. And uh, Eric Alterman was there. Not sure why, he's a fan of comedy. And... Um, he sat down with us and then proceeded to uh, re send back a drink that he had gotten with a waitress on air, our radio program, which, you know, these days <laughs> in podcasts, not that big of a deal. But back in the, back in the day, you're doing a radio show and it's on, you know, drive time in L.A. and in, in New York and Chicago and in Miami and a guy, your radio, like, three minutes of your radio time is taken up by somebody complaining about the drink that they had and sending it back. 
Uh, that was one of the highlights of my radio career, frankly. And then, of course, we had a ongoing many years where uh, Alterman would specifically eat during the interview um, on the phone. And uh, so many times, he, sometimes he would have dessert. Sometimes he would have a sandwich or something like that. That was back in the day. Uh, check out uh, Eric Alterman's uh, books, ladies and gentlemen. You, uh, there's a lot to learn, particularly in terms of like um, the relationship with society and the media. Working the refs, I think, was his, uh, he coined that uh, phrase in the context of the media. And um, it's a different era in, of the media, but um, still a dynamic that takes place. Hey, just want to remind you that uh, I'm very excited to introduce you to one of the coolest sponsors we've ever had, Hunt a Killer. It's a murder mystery subscription box. It's one of the most unique games out there, and it brings the fun of an escape room, which you cannot go to now, to your home. So check it out. Go to huntakiller.com slash majority. Use the promo code majority at checkout for 20% off your first box. That's huntakiller.com slash majority with promo code majority. Also, want to remind you, Blinkist. It takes the key insights from over 3,000 nonfiction bestsellers in over 27 categories and condenses them down into blinks. And these blinks you can listen to or you can, he or you, or you can read. 15 minutes, read or listen to them. It also offers its members exclusive original podcasts from top authors and creative thinkers. Check it out. Go to Blinkist.com slash Majority Report. Start your seven-day free trial and then get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership and up to 65% off of audiobooks. And these audiobooks you get to keep forever, folks. Um, very excited about uh, Nomi's show today, uh, covering the DNC. Nomi, I'm, this is a perfect time. I can't wait to talk to you about the uh, convention uh, last night, what your thoughts are about it. Yesterday, you had on, the, on your program, Thomas Frank, which you are uh, running now for an hour at 3 p.m., right after this mm -hmm. one, on uh, Patreon.com, The Nomi Key Show. On YouTube, and on YouTube. <laughs> but if you want to be a patron, go to Patreon. We're wait, doing it live. You got to speak. I, what's, why, Can you hear me? Hear? Something going on with a mic? Is she low or is that me? That's you. That's it's you. Me? Ah. Yeah. Why is everybody low for me now? Uh -oh. It's so strange. Oh, I know why. Okay. Um, I just fixed it. Sorry. It's one of those days. And uh, today on the program, John Nichols, and then you have a, a killer panel too. Is that right? Yeah, we have. So John Nichols is going to talk about uh, conventions in the past, but specifically he's going to hone in on uh, Henry Wallace and how he was kicked off the ticket uh, with FDR and the similarities between Bernie and and Henry Wallace's uh, Henry Wallace's progressive leadership. Uh, and then we have a panel with former CWA president, our revolution chair, former Bernie Sanders campaign chair, Larry Cohen. Jane Klebb, who is the founder of Bold Nebraska, she's the chair of the Nebraska Party, a uh, progressive force of nature, and Brent Welder, who uh, was just on the Rules Committee and proposed to get corporate money and lobbyists out of the party, and uh, that was shut down. So it'll be really interesting. This the, the first half of the week is really about the mechanics of the DNC. The second half is like, how do we organize and build in the future under a Biden presidency or a Trump presidency? Um, That's great. That is um, that's 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 super important at this at this stage. I mean, we'll talk more about the convention afterwards because I I did watch uh, most of it last night. Yeah. So that was not that's easy. That's why you're tired today. <laughs> that it was not easy. Uh, but um, <laughs> um, but what but what we will discuss more. But folks, um, the real way to watch this convention is to watch Nomi's show at 3 p.m. for an hour. So you know what to look for when you're going in it and you know what they're trying to do and you know why they're trying to do it mm -hmm. and then uh, figure out like the, and then you're basically doing what people do at a convention in real time when, when people actually show up and that's right. the convention part is really, there's the part that gets TV aired and then there's the part that actually people connect on the ground and they start to build networks and they start to strategize and they start mm -hmm. to sort of like, get a lay of the land. Um, I, I, I'm very excited to talk to you about all that um, in the fun half today. 
Uh, just a reminder, folks, uh, this program relies on your support. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. And also, I didn't want to get into this, but David Pakman <laughs> is running away. Running away. First of all, the charges he's leveling are just uh, enormous. I mean, the guy keeps saying over and over again, every time he talks about me, he says he's, this is, he's a joke. He says that about me. And it's really offensive. Uh, but aside from that, um, his, I don't know what he's doing to grow his subscribers. But folks, subscribe to this channel. Tell your friends, subscribe to this channel. Because he's just running away with it. It's disgusting. It's disgusting what he's doing. It's disgusting. It should be, this is, it's, it's total deep state stuff. <laughs> Anyways, uh, become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, AM Quickie. Uh, David Pakman may have a lot of subscribers on uh, his YouTube channel, but AM Quickie he does not have, and that thing is exploding. So uh, check that out. You can go to amquickie.com, or you just find it as a, a podcast on any of your podcast servers, or you can watch it on our other YouTube channel, Majority Report Live. It is, um, it is uh, seven minutes every morning. It's totally free, and uh, you get your progressive news, and then you're you're set. For the day, you go in uh, deeper with everything else that you see on this program and Nomi's program and also Matt's program. Matt, what's happening uh, on your your empire, your media empire? <laughs> yeah, tonight on, on TMBS, Dustin Gastel uh, joins us to discuss the, postal, the post office and also a kind of missed opportunity and capitalization of uh, the, T, the Tennessee Valley Authority labor issues on the right, there's sort of a right populist uh, win there, and he's going to discuss that. There's an article on the Jacobin about it. Basically, they were wanted to outsource some IT jobs, and some right-wing populists got in there with an anti-immigration play, and uh, not good, folks. So yeah, tonight on TMBS, uh, check that out, folks. All right, we're going to take a uh, quick break, head into the fun half. 646-257-3920 is the number. Um, <laughs> this is like, I love you, CM, but you seem a little bitter about Pacman. Don't be the maroor of your Seder. That's a good one. Uh, see you in the fun half. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want. To drive to the library, what you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. 
Nazis. I think I might be a Nazi. Agree. No. Death to America. Do. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way. Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up. Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Now me. Sam. Well, <laughs> let's start with this, okay? Let's really contextualize this conversation. Um... Because usually we go back and forth on news, but I sort of feel like you would be the guest I would have to give me an assessment of the convention yeah. if you weren't here uh, on Tuesdays anyways. I would bring you in to Thank say, you. let's start with this, Nomi. What is the purpose of a convention in conventional times? <laughs> a conventional convention. Yeah. Um. I mean, this has been a big question, I think, for the older members of the News Corps and the media world. Um, it just, you know, the John Nicholses of the world and the Thomas Franks and, and other folks, Dan Rathers, especially Dan Rather, who was kicked out of a convention. Um, I think that, you know, the, the convention of, of like the 60s uh, was more mechanical. And while there were a lot of things happening on the ground that were not democratic uh, with a lowercase d, they still had like use. So you still had to choose a nominee. They still had to choose a vice president. They still had uh, to vote on a platform. And it wasn't. Which uh, remind people there was no primaries at the time. Right. Exactly. Good point. Yes. So there, there was, was no primary. primaries. So you actually right. like, you know, maybe the one or two here or there. But the way that the the nominee was picked was actually at the convention. Right. Exactly. So it was actually chosen at the convention. And of course, like the party establishment would try to do whatever they could to and they did uh, to 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 push one candidate over another. And, and the famous case would be Henry Wallace. Um, but since like the neoliberal uh, takeover of the party, it's become more and more theatrical. And it's especially I'd say in the last, you know, 15 to 20 years, uh, the convention has become a huge opportunity for a group of of money makers in the party to throw parties, get contracts, have fun, rub you know rub elbows, go to uh, Thomas Frank last night said that you know the, the Democratic Party became essentially like what the Republican Party like their conventions are really fun because they serve lobster and Maker's Mark and and you know the Democratic convention basically has become a little bit of that too. Um, 2016, what was so interesting, and I I don't I mean I know your audience and my audience understands this, but I'm still surprised by how many people who watched the convention in 2016 had no sense of what was actually happening in that room. And that just proves how much it was theatrics. There was an uprising happening in the room uh, because just about half of the delegates were Bernie Sanders delegates. Hillary Clinton did not receive the number she needed to hit in terms of the nomination, clinching the nomination of pledged delegates, those are earned delegates, not super delegates, right. to win the nomination. And so as a result, Bernie had extraordinary leverage going into that convention to put forward policies that he wanted on the platform, rules changes, and essentially he said, you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm, you know, There's a lot of uh, mechanics behind the scenes that happened, but I'm not going to do that. And people were upset. And people who had raised money and uh, campaigned to get on the ballot and were sharing hotel rooms went to that convention, working people, and they were brushed up against what I think you, Sam, and I would probably usually see at conventions, which is a bunch of guys in suits that are the donor class yeah. and the operative class. And it was not a pretty sight seeing uh, these two forces up against each other. And, um, I mean, they you know, the, the, the staff of the DNC uh, is very skilled in – and controlling the optics. And those conversations, I don't think were people would have them prior to 2016, but what it did, 2016 opened up a, a space where people could talk about, well, well, who's really running the conventions? Who's really running the DNC? And why, what are we all props? As, as Dr. Jim Zogby, who's a longtime DNC member, has said, he, he sees the DNC, it's supposed to be um, 
the life of the party, like not the life of the party, but the, 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 the living, the DNC's platform and rules of the living document of the party. And the people of the DNC are supposed to be the soul. And that has been erased. And I think a lot of that has happened under, really since Bill Clinton, when he turned the, the Democratic National Committee and the conventions into an opportunity for his cronies to make money. And, and um, that means contracts. I mean, what does that mean specifically? Right. It's like, okay, your organization throws a party. Uh, your organization's a sponsor of the DNC. Um, you, uh, perfect example. In 2016, Uber was one of the major sponsors oh of God. the convention. Yes. David to Plouffe. Where, to, the point, to the point where you, if you took a taxi <laughs> to the DNC, you, got, you had to be dropped off literally like, Maybe a half a mile, a quarter mile away from the door. Yeah. But if you were, if you took an Uber, you would get right up to the door. And, and they had like this spa tent. I just refused to do the the Uber thing. Yes. Oh, they there was a spa tent. Yeah. Well, I stole some water from there, so I don't care about that. Yeah. No, I mean, yes. but this is it is ridiculous. They have these tents. You know, uh, they'll have different media companies put on these ridiculous events. I remember in 2012 in Charlotte, it was so hot. Huffington Post had like a spa. Uh, speaking of spas, they yeah. had like the nap rooms, and you could do, go do yoga classes and swing classes, and there was an organic juice bar, and like a, and it was all free. And I, I mean, this is. It's sort of like there's there's a there was a, there's a quality of, I mean, t- t- from my perspective, there's a quality of these conventions that are like uh, like it's like um, like a like Sundance Film Festival yes. sort of like yeah. type of type of thing where. And, and, you know, it's not as explicit as like, you know, vendors meeting up with this and that. And it's just the, the nature of, uh, of the people that are there. The other side of that, though, is, too, is that like it gives an opportunity for people who have basically been organizing online, um, who aren't necessarily, you know, uh, the posh set, as it were, to connect and develop strategies and whatnot. The big question up until, you know, 2016 was a little bit that this question seemed to merge. But prior to that, for decades, I can just remember every year the question would be why the news coverage would be like, why are we covering this? Yeah. Why this isn't a this is just there. This is just a big ad for them. Yes. And in and and so this time around. There was none of the. Like Uber's got a tent and, you know, like, hey, you know, come on in here, use our product. Uh, this is the this is a, a good um, you know product that we're going to sell your campaigns or this is like, you know, come and have the lobster. Let me let me tell you about why we need to have more fracking here or something <laughs> like that. I mean, that's and none that's of that, real. <laughs> none of that's going on. Yeah. So it is it is. And it's interesting because. I, I want to get your take on this, but my sense is, is like there's not an expectation by the people who put on. Let's look at specifically this convention. Right. I mean, this is just it is it exists. It's all virtual. Nobody was in the same room, practically. Um, and the 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 my sense is, is that the people who put this on the Biden team, the mm-hmm. DNC, they don't have an expectation that people are going to watch this, that the first order, the first order um, purpose of this is the news coverage the next day, right? That it's like, we're going to put this on. We know because we're political operatives, like any event that we do, it's all about like, what are the three or four headlines that are going to come out of this? Right. And you know, because I watch this thing and I'm like, oh, my God, John Kasich. Oh, my God, Meg Whitman. Oh, my God, Christy Todd Whitman. Whitman. Oh, my God, <laughs> Susan Molinari. Oh, my God. Out of, like, nobody even knows who she is. <laughs> nobody knows who she is. And but and they were on just and, and it turns out they're on for like 60 seconds, you know, maybe 15 seconds each. It's more like just like, hey, you know, just here to uh, uh, I'm. You know, uh, please invite me to your parties. You know, I'm no longer excommunicado or whatever, you know. And I have to say that on those very narrow terms, I think that they succeeded. You had, and here's my argument as to why they succeeded. You can see Fox News had John Kasich, former Republican, says he's not going to vote. You know, he can't vote for Donald Trump. Right. 
I look, I don't know that that's going to convince anybody to vote for, but in terms of like what, when they sat down and planned it out, their plan was like, we just want a couple headlines, Republicans abandoning Trump. Yeah. And then, you know, they had uh, Michelle Obama. She got rave reviews. You know, look, it's all, let me just be clear on this. The entire convention, except for Bernie's um, uh, speech, I guess, was all about Joe Biden's a nice guy and you can trust him. And it's all just sort of like, you know, it's about empathy. It's all just, it was all fluff. But <clears throat> this convention, by their design, I don't know that I would do it this way, by their design was like, we just need this to permeate the media veil and reach low information voters who are going to vote based upon like, yeah, he's, uh, I don't like Trump's tweets and Joe seems like a good guy. Eh, whatever. Bling. Right. And that's it. Right now. I don't, I don't know that there's that many voters out there like this. That's, that's my theory on this too. And we'll talk about it on my show at three o'clock. Um, they're, they're, the bet right now and, and the bet, let's just be clear. It's like they have two roads they can take. They can take the road of with working people really, really leaning in on like, like, let's have, you know, Dimenstein on from the postal workers on stage. Let's have like Sarah, uh, Sarah Nelson, who actually like outmaneuvered Trump. Like those are the types of people that uh, if you went, if you put them on stage, it would really excite working people who were depressed in 2016, meaning depressed, meaning they didn't turn out at the levels that they needed to. But instead, uh, there's the other path that they're taking, which is let's let's keep our donors happy. Let's keep our neoliberal philosophy. And, um, you know, maybe we can win a few more voters uh, that are are have left the Republican Party. Uh, you know, what would what would be these sort of milk toast white middle class, upper middle class uh, voters that I think Hillary already tried to win over, but maybe they think Donald, uh, uh, Joe Biden has more of a shot at doing so. I just, I don't know that. I think that's a huge risk. And anytime excitement is down, um, Democrats should be leaning into how do we excite working people. And I, I don't know. I, I've been reading a lot of. Um, but let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 I I'm, 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 I'm doing a little devil's advocate here. Sure. Okay. Because I, I certainly would have been far more interested. Because you're a liberal. Seen, so. And 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 Sarah Nelson and uh, you know AOC having more time and um, a whole host of people you know like I, I think Rebecca Tracy had a good article that basically said like this is a Democratic Party that was either completely unaware of what its future is right. or in denial or doesn't think it's important to right. highlight that now per you know personally for me I will, but I mean are people going to watch? Like, I mean, like, like are, 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 are people who are not, who are even somewhat jaded about politics or just not caring about politics, are they going to watch that thing no matter what? Or is it, are you saying that like the next day there would be articles that would say like Democrats push unions or yeah. something like that? I mean, that, like, I'm just like, I'm, I am a little bit skeptical that really that this is, you know, like, I don't know that it has any impact, but it certainly it certainly did for sure, like make progressives feel like these a-holes don't care about us. Right. I'm still going to vote for Joe Biden because, you know what, there's a lot of people who don't care about me and I still don't want Donald Trump to be president. Right. Um, but um, but I don't know that there's going to be I don't know that there's material impact can come out of this. Uh, one way or another in terms of like getting people to vote, but um, nobody's going to watch. Nobody's, you know, nobody's going to sit down and watch. Not many people are going to watch this thing. Are they? I, I mean, I don't, I think at this, the way it's designed right now, no, but if they had a great lineup, possibly if they mm. gave AOC more than 60 seconds, if they didn't, what I loved is that Bernie was supposed to open from what I understand. And, and, and then he didn't. And he was the only person who went live. Did you know that, too? Uh, Which, was he the only person who went live? Yeah, I don't know if he negotiated that or if they did. But if he negotiated, it was brilliant. I mean, he could have really <laughs> messed with them a little bit. I got um, the sense Clyburn went live, too, actually. Oh, Clyburn went live, too. I, did, I don't know They the did reason. two takes with him at the beginning where he oh, started. Oh, yeah, he did the then, thing. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, so 
I'm not sure. I think obviously if they had a lineup that spoke to most traditional Democratic voters, the actual base of the party, I'm not just talking about progressives. I'm talking about people who, you know, could have voted for Biden uh, instead of Trump if they had actually leaned into the values that 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 Donald Trump campaigned on that Hillary Clinton abandoned. Um, I just I think their bet is the same bet as 2016. Um, and they're also betting on the fact that, you know, mail-in voting and anti-Trump sentiment is 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 going to shift the election enough that they don't have to lean into to supporting working people. I mean, I don't it was so boring. It was so boring and so weird. Like Well, but it's gonna be weird. I mean it, it's a weird No, thing. it was weird. It was weird. Like you, you it know was what? it was an eighties infomercial. Let me tell you something. If here's my prediction. If the Republican Party, if the Republican convention came before the Democratic one, yeah. you'd be like, wow, that was pretty normal. <laughs> because I have a feeling the Republican convention, you want to talk about weird. I think the Republican convention, uh, let, let me we just, expect that. We expect that. We expect well, like I, cowboy I, no, hat I sheriff. That, I just think that like <laughs> doing a convention as, you know, like a TV show like they did, yeah. I think... I, I didn't like the content, but the format I thought was like, okay. I thought like, you know. It's because you're old, Sam. Come on. <laughs> but I mean, I, what's the other option? <laughs> no, but I'm serious. Like, I mean, I, yeah. I, believe me, I watched, I was like, this is boring. I was like, uh, first of all, I don't know who Eva Longoria is. I, I, I had what? to look that up. I didn't you know You don't who know who Eva Longoria is? No, I was like, where'd they get this infomercial person? I had no idea who she well, was. Well, I was in the room with somebody who's um, under 15, and, and she thought it was uh, – uh, Tulsi Gabbard. <laughs> oh, I was just like, I have like, I was just like, wow, this, I, this is, this is, I, this whole thing was strange, but yeah. um, le- the, how did you not know who she was? She was like, I, a, I she's just, always I, a democratic I, thing. She's at every convention. She's a big Obama person. She found a Latino victory fund, you know, was she's she their favorite like modern celebrity. family. No, she was on desperate housewives like 15 oh, years ago. I had no idea. But she's at all these events. She's a big, you know, how they, like America Ferreira, they, they have their go-to DNC that celebrities is. that they, they work with. I don't with. know who America Ferreira is either. I don't know any of these people. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter. But here is, this. Is, let's play this clip first. Like, you want to talk about bizarre. <laughs> I In a million years. Yeah. I, I'm like, where is the Venn diagram? <laughs> between the people this is clip number 15 the venn diagram between the people who are going to be swayed because they see um they see John Kasich Susan Molinari Christine Todd Whitman and uh and Meg Whitman and then they're like oh i'm going to vote for the democrats now and so then they're like i'm going to watch the rest of this whole thing and then this comes on at the end i loved it it was the best <laughs> <laughs> I love this. <laughs> this is completely insane. No, but it's beautiful. I it's think com- they were trolling the DNC. I think Billy Porter was like, "You want to go in? Let's do it." <laughs> I, I just think this is like, I like what? <laughs> like what? The, the video still- production on this is just like. Is literally like something that you would expect. Like, oh yeah, no, I did this for my. Uh, I take a fourth grade media class, and yeah, t- put the music down so we don't get uh, we don't get dinged on this. But uh, it's like, I, I mean, it's it's. I, I like the song. It's um, uh, you know, uh, the the old uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash uh, song. Uh, and I don't know um, this guy Porter. I don't really. I'm not familiar with his work, but um, I'm just looking at these like. The green screen doesn't look terribly sophisticated. They're just dropping these guys in. It's weird with like BLM protesters yeah. behind him yeah. a little bit. It's, I, I, it's, a, it's a way of of placing the current day uh, generation's protests within a broader context of protests. Um, no, this is that the- that video summarizes what the DNC is. They're like the Hamilton Democrats. The old like hippies who think they're they're you know they're not capitalists now, and like a bunch of people, a bunch of technocrats who really don't know how to do anything except collect checks and and create ads that suck. Like that is the DNC right there. 
Well, I mean, like, where they're like, oh, well, they loved Kasich. They love Molinari. <laughs> now they're going <laughs> to love this thing that looks like it was done by Tim and Eric. I mean, well, I don't get it. I think it's a, you had, you know, this is for like the real heads out there. This is for like, you stuck around till the end of the show. You're getting a little treat. You had your medicine. The real DNC heads. <laughs> yeah. You'll be here with us till the end. Here is where I think they, where, where they succeeded on their terms. Okay. Again, I want to just say like, this is the terms of the people putting this on. And frankly, I am increasingly of the uh, opinion that, what we're looking at in terms of the Democratic Party that that exhibited itself last night, we're looking at a dinosaur. And the fact is a dinosaur's tail wags for like 20 minutes after its head been lopped off. I don't really? know that for a fact if that's the Wait, is this, it, you're saying the DNC is the dinosaur or, or Joe Biden's the dinosaur? I'm saying everything that we saw last night yeah. looked to me like a party that was stuck in an era that no longer exists and they just aren't aware of it or maybe they are and they're just holding on white knuckled but um this is <clears throat> this is something that time will correct and i think it's unfortunate they don't they they don't they look like they're completely unaware of what's of, of where their future is and they're just trying to um you know pull it out i guess but here is um Here's a clip of Michelle Obama. She got the biggest, I think, you know, attention of the night. And 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 we'll play a clip of uh, Michelle Obama, and then we'll play a clip of Fox News, which suggests to me that as far on their own terms, the people who put this together last night must feel it's a success. I don't know if it is, but here is Michelle Obama. The cold, hard truth. So let me be as honest and clear as I possibly can. Donald Trump is the wrong president for our country. He has had more than enough time to prove that he can do the job, but he is clearly in over his head. He cannot meet this moment. He simply cannot be who we need him to be for us. It is what it is. Now, that was like, that's the way that you talk about on some level, the way you talk about like um, your, you're almost like your romantic partner. Like th that's like, that's the, that, that is the, the, the kind of talk that you have with yourself or your therapist or your friend about why you're getting divorced. And I, I just thought that was sort of an interesting way of putting it. Like, it's not just that he's he's incompetent. It's that like you're not going to change him, right? <laughs> and and it, you know she's not talking to people who like you know she's not talking to Democrats there, right? She's talking to people on the the fence on some level because everybody else is going to vote against him. Like she's not she's not trying to rally uh, people to support Biden. She's just saying that, like, look, we got to do better than this and anything's going to be better than this. And now there's other parts where she's talking about Biden. But look at the look at this Fox News um, response to it. Now, granted, it is um, it's not Sean Hannity, but it's still Fox News. Yeah. Over the course of the night, the first virtual convention of our history, I think they would say that Michelle Obama stuck the landing. Chris Wallace, your thoughts? Well, I agree with Dana. You know, it's interesting. Michelle Obama, as she said, doesn't like politics. And uh, she said that this speech was her main contribution uh, to the Biden campaign. It was a heck of a contribution. She really flayed, uh, sliced and diced Donald Trump, talking about the chaos and confusion and lack of empathy, especially coming from this president and from this White House. Spoke more about the deficits of Donald Trump than the pluses of Joe Biden but did talk about especially, not so much policies, but especially his empathy, what he's been through and his care for average Americans. She said, we have to vote. I mean, what, you know, if you're the DNC, you're, you're, you know, and you put that uh, convention on, you're taking that clip and you're sending it around and trying yeah. to get contracts for, 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 you know, future like that, like that literally I would imagine is in their minds, you know, in their minds, again, 
I think that is mission accomplished. Right. I mean, now there may be other nights of the convention where it's like for people like us, like get us psyched to go out and work. And usually you would do that like in later in the convention, I guess, because there was nothing. There was not a lot in that, it seems to me, to inspire people to go out and, you know. Like a vision of what could be. It really was just like, you know, like, let's just get away from this as much as we can. She's no. the mediator. I think, um, you know, it was telling that that the election coverage people at Fox News tend to be the people who don't like Trump. Um, I know a lot of our audience doesn't watch Fox News, but that's generally who, you know, used to be what they called the news side. So Chris Wallace does not like Trump. Dana Perino does not like Trump. I don't know who else was on that panel. They're there to cover, like, the polls. Very rarely do you see, like, the Hannity's come in when it comes down to, like, assessing the numbers and the facts right. and whatever little reputation Fox has. Um, but I think, that the, the, I think that the Biden campaign knows that. And they also know the same thing with, with, with MSNBC. And you think back two, three years ago when MSNBC started putting on Republicans, Nicole Wallace, uh, Rick Wilson, all these different Republicans who come on now. Bill Crystal, Bill Crystal, uh, Ruben. Ruben, yeah. exactly, that have taken your spot, Sam. Um, no, I mean, but that, that's the reality. It's like they, they basically, I think this has been a long uh, three-year campaign to win over uh, uh, defected Trump supporters into the Democratic Party so that they don't have to, again, lean into working people. And so um, knowing that, like, say, 65% of of those who make under fifty thousand dollars that would be traditional democratic voters will turn out but it won't be a hundred percent but it's okay because we'll win back the rest by yeah, bringing we'll in see the i mean i don't I, I you know like i again i i i agree with you like i don't think this is the proper strategy but I, on their own terms i think they they did well and i should also say that was not Crosby, Stills, and Nash. It was Buffalo, was say, Springfield. That was Buffalo, was Buffalo Springfield. Springfield. I know. I, I didn't want to correct you on that. I apologize. No, no, you should. But it was Stephen Stills from Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Correct. Because, correct. Yeah. He had a couple of. Um, he also he also did the super sessions with uh, Al Co- uh, Michael uh, Al Cooper and Mike Al uh, Cooper and Mike Bloomberg. Bloomberg. Yeah, Bloomfield. <laughs> no, it was actually Mike Bloomberg. That's a little known fact. He was, was a great guitar player. No, there I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> that is actually a great album too. Uh, those super sessions. Manassas, um, too, is a great one. That's a Stephen Stills solo record I would recommend. Um, I should also uh, just say that in terms of MSNBC, their move to uh, Republicans was not, was really more about them wanting to be more Republican. I mean, that was Andy Lack was a Republican. You really, so you he, really yeah, but like him taking over was not some sort of... I mean, why would MSNBC choose a former Republican to run? Well, it's not MSNBC. The they don't NBC. choose. There's no MSN. It's why would MB- N- NBC, NBC do it? Because NBC Comcast, doesn't, Comcast, and 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 uh, you know, I mean, I think I actually think that they don't even. I I mean, I think like as long as they feel, you know, I know for a fact that back in the day, in the early aughts, um, when. MSNBC was right wing where Joe Scarborough yeah. had a primetime show Tucker with Tucker Carlson, Pat Buchanan, um, and uh, Frank Luntz worked there. That, oh, wow. I that, that. that Bob Wright from General Electric, is that his name? Bob Wright? Uh, would, because GE owned the majority of that oh, network. Oh, and that GE time. was run by, what's his name, who just died? Uh, Trump supporter, uh, very famous. Was it not like, Bob Wright? No, uh, um, billionaire. He just died. He's bald. I can't remember. Someone uh, Google that. No, it's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, no, that was Viacom. It's not that guy. No, no, uh, no, no, but, no, no. But whatever. He would when he would hear anti-war stuff, he would call down and say, "That's got that. That can't happen." Because wow. General Electric is the biggest, uh, one of the biggest arms dealers, um, and. And then, but I think beyond that, Comcast just likes to lay low. They just don't want too, too much controversy. And I don't think that they really cared as long as it's within certain parameters, right? Um, Whether it was like leaning Republican or leaning Democrat. And Andy Lack came in and he's a Republican. He's just like, we're going to lean Republican. And if it weren't for Donald Trump, I think that's what they would have done. It's just that they, they basically got jammed. I mean- they're, they were trying to get away from their entire uh, lineup. 
I mean, remember when O'Donnell, there was like that report, so they firing O'Donnell. Mm-hmm. They fire like all that. That was if they had their way, the whole thing. It was Jack Welsh. Yes, Jack Welsh. thank you. Yeah. Um, if they had their way, then um then 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 it would all have been sort of like center right as opposed to center left. So the shift really just happened when Bush's approval during the war dropped so low and then it went straight to, it was just the Obama years. That's literally the only time MSNBC has ever been progressive. I can't believe. Yeah. Like, oh, it was just, it was a fluke. Keith Olbermann just started basically, was, do, you know, uh, started imposing some type of like, uh, you know, left wing ideology in, in 2005. I don't even call it a left wing ideology. He was anti Trump. He was anti Bush. And, um, that just worked in terms of ratings. And so they just went in that direction. Hmm. I, I mean, I, you know, like the, and it wasn't, and I think also it's not just a question of ratings in that dynamic. It's like, it's like Fox business. Fox business has 7,000 people who watch it, but they all right. drive Bentleys. And so That's you right. can sell a lot of stuff to them. And in this instance, it was just the one place, the, you know, TV outlet that, 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 liberals could go. And uh, so there, you, you had them all there and you could sell them to them. I mean, so, I mean, I think that like, you know, once you set it up, it's almost like one of those, like, you know, it's like a, one of those wind up toys. You set it up and you're aiming it in a direction. You don't have to police it once it starts going because it's already on a track. And every now and then they, they shift it and they shift right. the track and where it's going. And I think it's probably going to shift uh, again uh, because they're finding like this works for us. So, um, but let's go to the phones. Hmm. Calling from a 210 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Good afternoon, Sam. This is John from San Antonio. John from San Antonio. How are you, John? I'm good. So today, Florida will hold its primary and brand new Congress endorsed. Jen Perlman is running uh, in the 23rd District of Florida against (laughs) Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Perlman has raised uh, over $320,000. Uh, and then you, you had an interview with uh, Perlman for Ring of Fire, which originally aired on uh, October 11th of last year. Yep. So uh, she's got a little little controversy with uh, Wasserman Schultz uh, supposedly pushing one of the volunteers from Perlman on Saturday. So hopefully we'll see an upset there. So in the 6th District, 28-year-old Richard Thripp, who endorsed uh, Our Revolution, is, is endorsed by Our Revolution Florida, the leading Democratic fundraiser and has raised over $108,000. Uh, this Central Florida district is currently represented by Republican Michael Waltz, who won his district by 13 points in 2018. The 20th district is a majority black district and is currently represented by 83-year-old Alcee Hastings, uh, who's been serving longer than any Floridian in Congress. Uh, progressive uh, Sheila Sherfillis Mc- McCormick has raised almost $70,000, and Hastings has raised uh, under a half a million, which is extremely low for an incumbent. Uh, this could be a big upset considering uh, the the recent uh, uh, boon for uh, black uh, progressive candidates. Uh, progressive uh, all Albert Chester is challenging one of the most conservative members of the Democratic caucus, Al Lawson, in the 5th District. Both Lawson and Chester are black candidates in this panhandle district where 48% of the population is black. In the third district, 26-year-old Adam Christensen states on his website that he, he was ready to be a champion for the working class as a member of Congress. Christensen is second in fundraising in the race, and I hope he pulls off the upset. Uh, Republican Ted Yoho is retiring in this seat that he won by 15 points in 2018. The 21st district majority report listener Greedo Weiss is running to unseat Luis Frankel. You interviewed Weiss on Ring of Fire on May 29th. Uh, Sikana Latola is running against incumbent Frederica Wilson in the 24th District. Uh, Wilson uh, has also had fundraising woes and has only raised $266,000. On her donor page, Latola uh, states, uh, Sikana is challenging the corporate establishment to reshape the government to one, of, one that puts the people first. Uh, In Alaska, candidates from the Democratic, Libertarian, and Alaskan Independent Party appear on the same ballot with the highest place for each candidate, uh, each candidate receiving the party nomination. Uh, Al Gross, who is a Democrat, uh, who's running as a Democrat, even though he calls himself an independent, has raised $5.2 million, and it was only down by 
five points to Republican incumbent Dan Sullivan. According to my numbers, this is number 10 of the 12 races where a Democrat is either uh, as a lead or is down by six points or less. Uh, if the current polling holds up, I have Democrats winning in Arizona. These are Senate races, uh, North Carolina, Colorado, Maine, and Iowa. That would give uh, Democrats a 51-49 advantage in the Senate if Doug Jones loses in Alabama. Three races are toss-ups in uh, South Carolina, Kansas, and the Purdue race is a, a toss-up in, in Georgia. Four more races, lean Republican, uh, with, with polling leads between four and six points in Texas, Alaska, Mississippi, and Montana. Boom. There you have it. Um, okay. So one of the things I, I was – a few months ago I was comparing this to uh, – you know, is this going to be similar to the 2008 election as far as, you know, down ballot and the lead by Biden? And I, I, I don't know. Things have tightened up a little bit. But I mean, uh, I mean, you could you're seeing a lot of House races where where, you know, not necessarily progressives, but, you know, other, you know, just re regular main uh, Democrats are having leads. And I, I think they, they can come you know really close to the number they had you know at the end of the after the 28 uh, house race i mean i don't think they're going to hit 60 like they had you know in, in the senate after 2008 but uh you know i'm hope i'm very hopeful one thing about the convention also is that you know they are really neglecting younger voters by not not uh promoting progressives yeah I mean, pretty obvious fact but i mean you know if you look at the ways that biden can lose i mean i think it's the the main what main thing in my book is is our progressives going to turn out i mean because usually you know historically that's the the biggest margins uh no matter you know whether it's a i mean the, they've all been pretty much uh moderate candidates anyway but the but they all come from younger voters. I mean, the, the margins are huge among younger voters, and then older voters usually have a tendency to go Republican. And I mean, even in the Clinton election uh, in 2016, it was that way, but it, not as much as Obama. And so, like, are are the younger voters going to turn out for Biden? I mean, that's the biggest question. Yeah, in I, my I mind. think. I, let me take issue just with you saying progressives. You know, I think younger people um, are, for the most part, you know, far more progressive than older folks. But I don't, the question isn't whether they're coming. I think it's really just about are they excited? Are, are young people being talked to? And I think like, you know, the the idea that you would not put on AOC, who is the most like electric politician that has shown just like put aside for a second ideology. The most electric politician the Democrats have had since Barack Obama gave his speech in 04, which launched him, incidentally. Right. I mean, everybody remembers that. Um, and to not have to not use that is such a waste, it seems to me, um, like to not utilize that huge asset you have uh, just seems sort of shocking to me. I, the only thing I can imagine is that, A, they're terrified of empowering um, those folks. Although I don't know why that would empower, you know, them. Uh, they don't want her more popular, but she's, a, she's a juggernaut. You're not going to stop her from being popular or they're just like uh, young people are not going to watch this convention anyways. And the one line about AOC is great. is not going to do anything. People already think she's great. I mean, that's the only thing I can imagine. I mean, my, my thought is I just think that they're exercising whatever control they still have. Um, it's very limited and it's I mean the demographics are the demographics as you keep saying like time is time and and I think the the perfect illustration of that is investing in Kamala Harris who is young and sort of speaks enough to the next generation in some ways um, at least identity wise that like she could potentially keep power for 12 years for the neoliberals as they fight demographics just as the Republicans do I mean this is the Republican strategy you know gerrymandering and stacking the courts and everything like that is all a fight against time for them because yep. they they just don't have the numbers. John, appreciate the phone call. 
Great insights. All right, thank you. Um, here is um, Bernie Sanders speaking at the um, the convention. He was the only one who mentioned like issues. He was very frank about like I don't agree with uh, Biden on a lot of stuff, but there's some you know broad principles we share, which you know is shares sure. more than than <laughs> certainly with Republicans. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they're not even talking about the public option now, yeah. right? I mean, Anybody that knows. was sort of what Biden was talking about: public option as opposed to just sort of increase subsidies, um, put in a real public option. They're dropping Medicaid, Medicare to 60 under Biden's plan. They were dropping it under to 55 under Clinton. I guess the only oh, he's not going to have an option soon. It's just What's not going to happen. Democrat. I mean, it's just not. It, it, there's no way we come out of the pandemic and he can get away with it. He's the, Congress is going to have to do something. They're going to have to do something, and it's going to yep. come from Congress. It's not going to come from Biden. We, this is a fantasy land we're living in right now. To whatever appease his donors, whatever it is, they're going to be in a bit. He's going to whatever 2008 was. Multiply that times ten crises. I agree totally. Here is uh, here is Bernie basically saying, let's protect the future of the democracy. I mean, let's listen to the clip first. Mm -hmm. My friends, I say to you, to everyone who supported other candidates in the primary and to those who may have voted for Donald Trump in the last election, the future of our democracy is at stake. The future of our economy is at stake. The future of our planet is at stake. We must come together, defeat Donald Trump, and elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as our next president and vice president. My friends, the price of failure is just too great to imagine. Thank you. I mean, the the pitch is basically like, you know, um, you don't want to reach for the stars because you're on a very precarious uh, ladder is what he's saying. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to, right? Like the risk is too great to uh, not really pursue. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 I tend to agree. I also think that there is a much better chance. Bernie Sanders is going to be far more empowered. AOC is going to be far more empowered under a uh, Biden Harris uh, administration than they would a, a Trump administration, just in terms of like the ability to get stuff done, even if it's half a loaf. So I mean, that's just uh, the reality at this stage. I mean, but we but, lost. But, but, <laughs> we I, lost I understand the that. race that in, that that counted. I'm I'm gonna play a little bit of devil's advocate here. I I, I agree with you. I'll, now it's on my side. When when the Democrats win, right, and if they win, whether they win the Senate, con keep Congress, whatever it is. Um, and the DNC, suddenly the actual power will be back in the establishment's hands. So what makes you think that they're not going to exercise that power over progressive movement? Because, yes, they'll be fighting off Republicans, but not in the same way that they were before. I think, I mean, look, uh, from a legislative perspective, I think that's going to be a, a mixed bag. But when, when, when Barack Obama won... You had no outside groups. All the outside groups were basically in the veal pen, as it were, and they had been starved of resources uh, because they were all about access. It was nothing even remotely close to something like Justice Democrats, which 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 had a mission mm -hmm. of challenging Democrats. There's nothing remotely close to, um, you know, matriarch or other organizations which were completely. I mean, Obama said at this time in 2008, the word was out, June, July, August, you do not give money to outside groups, period, end of story. And these are outside groups that were basically like, you know, outside groups, you know, outside groups insofar as like they needed to have transactional relationships with the Democrats. And they, even they were starved because right. Obama wanted to control. He was starting to, you know, uh, Obama for America was up and running, but that was shut down by December, basically. Pushed into the DNC. 
pushed into the DNC, just completely, you know, uh, like disemboweled, as it were. Yeah. The dynamic is going to be very, very different. The dynamic is going to be very, very different going into this. And, you know, uh, Nancy Pelosi, if she's hanging on, she's just hanging on. There's nobody there who's going to believe that Nancy Pelosi is going to be there in four years. And, uh, and, and so there's, the dynamic is, um, is different. Mm-hmm. The terrain is different where the American public is different. Uh, you know, the, the, the American, you know, the American public is, they, they can ignore it maybe over the course of these three or four months that 60% of uh, voters under the age of 40, I think, voted for either Bernie or Warren. And, uh, you know, and, and the majority of those Bernie. Mainly Bernie. <laughs> yeah, mainly Bernie. But I mean, um, but I, I would imagine that those young people who voted for Warren uh, subscribe to that same issue set, frankly. So it's not just about Bernie. It's about where they are on mm-hmm. the uh, the issues. And, you know, 40 is not that young. Like, you can ignore Thank that you. when it's like 24 <laughs> and under, you know, but 40, not that yeah. young. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, within two cycles, they're in middle age. Like, I mean, this is this is where the party is going. And, um for younger politicians, right? Like even Hakeem Jeffries, for that matter, they're going to need to pretend a Hakeem Jeffries is going to have to pretend to pay some lip service. Uh, he is. And, and, you know, and, and he is. And the problem is, pretend, is that I should say pretend huh? to he's yes. he's pretending lip service. I want to make that very clear. It's right. not like he's. But the problem that a Hakeem Jeffries has when he pretends this is that the level of sophistication of the progressive voter today is much different than it was 15 20 years ago i'm sorry like it's like you know they're not going to get away with it right and there's not going to be this presumption that because you're in the cbc that you are progressive that's not going to happen anymore like you know we're seeing this you know where the cbc doesn't support jamal bowman they support (laughs) angle (laughs) right right i mean like the the they're Clown time is over in many yeah. respects. And so um, I, I don't think that we're going to get uh, the progressive. Um, I don't think we're going to get even 60 percent of what progressives want. But the fact is, is that like we're going to get 40 percent or 30 percent. And the bottom line is, is like those losses between 30 and 75 percent of what we want. They're going to they're, they're We're going to take a piece out of the establishment in this instance because this is going to be i'm just comparing this to 2008 where it was just like joe biden and ken conrad you know or uh you know and uh, uh um uh they're they're standing in the way of this stuff and having by and blah 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 Do, people aren't going to get away with that stuff anymore well, it's just I not going to happen if you look at like 2006 do you remember after uh 2004 i should say after Kerry was swift voted, all these organizations, the Democracy Alliance came together, all these like billionaire supposed progressives wanted to invest in and start organizations that hit on things like national security from a progressive uh, perspective or uh, invest in like move on for voting or I can't remember all the organizations that existed back then. Latino outreach. And they shifted and they still exist. They shifted their investments. But I think a lot of those organizations, I mean, dare I say it, became more or less compromised because they were dependent on large dollar donations. And so I think the difference between this time around is is even if there are organizations that are seemingly progressive that could potentially get compromised because they're leaning on higher dollar donors or institutional backers or whatever it is because they just need to function in the long term or have some sophisticated staff that like, you know, didn't just come out of activism, but like know how to win elections and know how to break down the maps and know how to, you know, pick a poll or whatever it is. Um there's going to be another set of groups that pops up. And so like, that is what I think the difference is, is even I if you, for every agree bought out, you know, a slightly compromised organization, whether you see it or not, another one's going to pop up, you know, for every WFP, that, that's there's what a sunrise. I, that's, right. Well, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Like with, with, you know, the justice Dems and, 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 and other groups like that is that in, in by compromise, and that's what we, we used to call the veal pen. And you're basically in there the reason why they get compromised is because 
their funding is contingent upon their transactional relationship with those in power yep. exclusively on that yep. because they don't have any outside power and, and they don't have any outside donors. And so to get the big donor money, you need to go show that you have access to, look, I'm having lunch with the undersecretary of blah, blah, blah. And we're, you know, this legislation sitting on their desk and this piece of legislation is going to hit, you know, Pelosi's desk or whoever's desk. And you need to show that to get the funding. And that's basically how it works. That structure is different now. And the right. reason why the, the reason why the Republicans, the reason why there was like, you know, uh, uh, Democrats hate their uh, base and Republicans fear theirs. The reason why the Republicans feared their base was because there were outside resources that those people had, whether it was, um, you know, what's his face with, uh, oh shoot. Um, the the club for growth or oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Koch uh, brothers yeah. i mean they they would go at uh republicans and the reason why they feared them was because they had power they had money and um you know and they were crazy like there were crazy rich dudes who just had one issue that they cared about usually taxes that rubbed up against the the establishment you know the bush era establishment the Koch brothers weren't well, pro-bush it wasn't by just, the way. It wasn't just about taxes i mean you know get forced to freeze you sure, know you're right, yeah you're the right. abortion you got um you know uh um uh, i'm thinking the, of a the contract with america and that that crap yes so i mean that's that's basically what it comes down to um let's see uh speaking of which here's john Kasich. this is just bizarre john Kasich. uh first off uh one for some reason, they decided, let's start off. I think it's probably a crane shop, but I think it, it feels like he's being sized up by a drone. And uh, then he claims we're at a crossroads. Here's John Kasich wooing all of those Republicans who watched the Democratic convention. America is at a crossroads. Oh God, Sometimes outfit. elections represent a real choice, a choice we make as individuals and as a nation about which path we want to take when we've come to challenging times. America is at that crossroads today. The stakes in this election are greater than any in modern times. Many of us have been deeply concerned about the current path we've been following for the past four years. It's a path that's led to division, dysfunction, irresponsibility, and growing vitriol between our citizens. Continuing to follow that path will have terrible consequences for America's soul because we're being taken down the wrong road by a president who has pitted one against the other. He's unlike all of our best leaders before him who work to unite us, to bridge our differences and lead us to a united America. I'm a lifelong Republican. All right, pause it for one second. I mean, second. I, listen. Um, all of what he's saying is complete pablum right i mean and also not true right um i you know i remember when the dixie chicks had their albums burned literally in big mass burnings i remember when you know qurans were burned got news for you there's a lot of uh, americans who are muslim um the 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 idea that this is that trump has innovated polarization is just bullshit bullshit this is and like it, it's like the, it, it's it, but but continue <laughs> a lifelong republican but that attachment holds second place to my responsibility to my country that's why i've chosen to appear at this convention in normal times something like this would probably never happen but these are not normal times I'm proud of my Republican heritage. It's the party of Lincoln who reflected oh, its founding God. principles of unity and a higher purpose. But what I have witnessed these past four years belies those principles. Many of us can't imagine four more years going down this All path. right. I, I, can't, I can't hear any more of this. Why I, I mean, listen, I, I, I will remind you, if folks want to take a time, go and read what the Republican Party that supported uh, Abraham Lincoln wanted. Just go and read a little bit about what was what they were wanted in Reconstruction. All the things that they wanted, the party of Lincoln wanted things today that we can't, we, uh, you know, the Democrats 
still support, but maybe they could get a little stronger on them. You know, things like public schools and uh, I mean. And Reconstruction was also deeply flawed. So yes. Well, that was a function of Johnson in many respects. But if you look at what the radical Republicans, the radical Republicans wanted in 1865, 1866, 67, 68, what they wanted. John Kasich, I got news for you. I would be the first guy to vote for John Kasich if he wanted that stuff. Um, but isn't this just about tone? Isn't it just it's like... It's all about it. tone. It's, it's all like, about tone. Guys, this is, this I'm is the Republican low. that talks to Democrats. Listen, fun fact. In New Hampshire, on primary night, I, I was there covering it. I was on the Democrat. I was with Bernie. But later on the night, guess which Republican invited me into his little party? John Kasich. I was literally in the room watching him in New Hampshire. Because he was the one who reached out to Democrats because he wanted to make sure there were, and there were like 50 people there. They wanted to make sure that he still had an open line of communication with Democrats. Didn't mean I was rooting for him. I was just there covering it. Let me make that clear. But I guess I'm skeptical, too, of like this country first thing, because that was also John McCain's uh, yeah. uh, campaign slogan. And I will remind you, he is the one who picked Sarah Palin. And without Sarah Palin, there is no Donald Trump. Period. Right. End of story. No doubt about it. Like he, also, uh, okay. he, no, he basically midwifed Donald Trump. Uh, Brendan pointed out that uh, <laughs> Brendan pointed out that it's not a uh, it's not a crossroads. It's more of a fork in the road. And I also point out, just metaphorically, there's not a path straight down the middle. You have to choose the left fork or the right fork. So, you know, maybe we should decide which one of those we want to take. Didn't no, also the radical Republicans want? Uh, Confederate generals executed after the war as yes. part of re- reformation. Re- that's, that's what I said. Uh, if Kasich <laughs> calls for that, willing to uh, vote for him. <laughs> Boom. You got it. Um, here is, this was interesting. Um, they, they had a, um, a message from a former DHS chief of staff under Christian Nielsen, a guy's name, uh, Miles Taylor. Uh, let's listen to him. Is this the, uh, the, this clip number five, this isn't his talk from the, uh, the convention, right? But it's an interview after the fact. This was the ad that, uh, they ran that everyone was posting. Oh, and do we have the interview, uh, too, or no? We had the interview this morning from, uh, good morning. Yeah, America. let's run that. So he had an ad and we should just say that he, you know, the ad is, it, well, let's play a little bit of the ad and then we'll run the, um, then we'll run the, the, the clip. I'm Miles Taylor. I served as the chief of staff of the Department of Homeland Security under the Donald Trump administration. I would go into the office, I would read my intelligence brief, and then it was my job to help the Department of Homeland Security to keep our country safe. What we saw week in and week out, and for me after two and a half years in that administration, was terrifying. We would go in to try to talk to them about a pressing national security issue, cyber attack, terrorism threat. He wasn't interested in those things. To him, they weren't priorities. The president wanted to exploit the Department of Homeland Security for his own political purposes and to fuel his own agenda. The California wildfires, on a phone call with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, he told FEMA to cut off the money and to no longer give individual assistance to California. He told us to stop giving money to people whose houses had burned down from a wildfire because he was so rageful that people in the state of California didn't support him and that politically it wasn't a base for him. The policies at the border, he wanted to restart zero tolerance and separate families. He said he wanted to go further and have a deliberate policy of ripping children away from their parents to show those parents that they shouldn't come to the border in the first place. A lot of the time, the things he wanted to do not only were impossible, but in many cases illegal. He didn't want us to tell him it was illegal anymore because he- There it is. So now my my perspective on this is is twofold. One is, OK, this could be this could have impact on people who, you know, uh, uh, who would not be who might be on the fence of voting for Biden. I don't know if there's many of those people, frankly, but maybe it solidifies some of those people who have come over to vote for Biden. And then, of course, um, and that's all well and good. This is a guy in my mind when I see this. He is on a uh, reformation program. This is this is Larry Wilkerson, God bless his soul, uh, coming out and defending Colin Powell after the war. I mean, this is this is project. Uh, I need to rehabilitate myself. And for me personally, I would say to this guy, thank you for your service. Now, please into the gulag. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, if you want to do an ad that talks about these issues, have family members who have been separated talk about their personal experiences. Have a nurse talk about the fact that they don't have, you know, the protection to walking into the hospitals. Have the people who are literally firsthand on the front lines affected by these issues, not some freaking hack well, to who's going to get a job on MSNBC next week. Well, to be fair, they did do that. There was that woman whose father died. Well, uh, in the convention, and, and, yeah, 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 in the convention, and they and, and this, this ran during the convention. I think this clip did run during the convention, or is in an ad. But let's listen. Here's the, the guy being interviewed because um, this is the best part about this. Like, uh, look, I'm happy to have the have the have the guy do this because I think it could be effective. But let's not kid ourselves, folks. Um, it, there's a reason why we haven't heard this guy's name in two, you know, in, in two years or whatever it is, uh, or and there's a reason why he stuck with it for two and a half years, right? But go. Two, uh, Jared Kushner is basically suggesting that you were fired. What's your response? So, George, first and foremost, thanks for having me this morning. Look, I'll say this: as far as cashing in goes. In Donald Trump's Washington, <laughs> there's no doubt that doing this is going to be tough for me reputationally, professionally, and it's certainly going to take a hit at my pocketbook. This has nothing whatsoever to do oh, about man. money. This has to do about being honest about the president and putting country before party. As far as Jared goes, look, he and I got along quite well during the administration. Um, my point here is not to slander anyone else that served under the president. My focus is on the character of the president himself which is what this election is going to be about. What were the circumstances okay. of the leaving? Um, uh, that's all we need. First off, the guy is now a Google governmental affairs, um, lo basically a lobbyist for Google. And it is true, in Donald Trump's uh, Washington, he will not do well. This is a guy who's making a bet that in four months, it's going to be Joe Biden's Washington, and he's going to do quite well. And so the... The idea that he's taking a big hit, I don't think so. And I also think that, like, you know, you want to talk about character. I'm happy to, ha you know, have you maybe sway a couple of votes. But let's be honest. If you're you're sticking with the uh, Trump administration for two and a half years, nah, I think your character's in question, too. Well, it's, it's just like this. It's the technic It's the revolving door of the technocrat lobbyist types. Speaking, I mean, why is it that the technocrats want him? Because he's of a certain type that speaks to the upper middle class Trump voter that they want to sway. Again, you know, if you really want to sway the masses and maybe even some some empathetic like capitalist, upper middle class capitalist, you have the person who's experienced this this injustice firsthand, not the guy who was sitting in office who, who just traded out on his next job. I mean, this just it's it. This is Obama era all over again, in my opinion. Right. Well, I don't know. I think I think we're, I think I think the left is in better shape than than. Yes, yes, no, but I mean, in terms of the decisions that are being made, uh, when Obama, his people took over much of Hillary Clinton's campaign, I think a lot of those technocrat decisions weren't actually Clintonian. They were actually very, very much coming from the Obama consultants that were deciding, you know, to invest in big data, which proved to be false yep. and to not go into Wisconsin. I mean, Bill Clinton was pushed out of the circle when he said, go to Wisconsin. So this is, I don't know where this is going to lead us, guys, yeah. but I'm not feeling great about it. Also, to anyone who might be concerned, who might be thinking this guy could be some sort of resistance hero, he seems to have ran point on the protecting children narrative with under Christian Nielsen at DHS and yeah. uh, spinning yes. the sorry. children in cages story. So... <laughs> We can if lay you don't off this quit, <clears throat> if you don't quit way before he, this exactly. guy did, then I'm sorry. It he just needed I to don't find buy a job, it. Sam. It, had, but, it took time. He had to find a backup job. You know that you gotta, Google process yes. is a it's a long process. I you needed have to take tests. I was interviewing the whole time. <laughs> um, here is uh, Donald Trump. Uh, we talked about Donald Trump being a pathological liar. Here is the most honest thing I've ever heard a politician say in this country, or even frankly. I think anybody in the media, you know, like in the in the mainstream media, I don't think I've heard anybody really articulate this, which is that America's policy towards Israel in this day and age, and it's been this way, I think, for about 10 to 15 years, at least, is not a function of 
the Jewish community in this country. There are certainly uh, some very big right-wing uh, Jewish supporters of Israel in this country. But the, the real political power for Israel in this country comes from the evangelical Christian movement, and that has been building since the mid to late 70s. And, and, and Donald Trump just basically told you about it. Remember, the interesting thing about Donald Trump is when he looks at polling and when they come in and give him and they tell him like this and that, he always says the, the, the subtext of everything, and he can't help himself. Yeah. Here it is. And we move the capital of Israel to Jerusalem. That's for the evangelical. <laughs> you know, it's amazing with that. The evangelicals are more excited about that than Jewish people. That's so, right. It's incredible. What? That's an ad right there. What? Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it's also it's also fascinating. He's like the evangelicals, like he says, like the blacks, the yeah. evangelicals. Like he just he, he he is incapable of seeing the humanity of anyone, right? Like everybody is just like, how does this thing help me? He's told like, listen, this is going to really help you with the evangelicals, and he's like, oh, okay, and he doesn't like. The, there's no, and I think on some level, the weird thing about it is. They like that naked honesty. Yeah. I mean, people do. It's just that, you know, I don't like uh, what he's saying because I don't like him and I don't like what, what, what you know, what the outcomes are. But um, the idea that he's being that explicit, like, here, look what I'm giving you. Like, it's a very material benefit to them, uh, you know, in their worldview. And, um, I, I mean, I think that, I mean, if... I, I would I would I would dip that in amber if there was a way to do that and just carry it around because that is an important dynamic to, to for for all folks in this country to realize. That's a Maybe really important that guy from before, whatever his name was, Kevin or Steve or whatever the guy from DHS was, maybe he should have planted some secret strategy on Donald Trump's desk. And if he really wanted to implode the presidency, he would have gave gave him that. I would imagine there would have been a a myriad of different ways in which you could do it. But at the very least, like, you know, you can't talk about character and stick in that administration for two years. (laughs) Calling from a 910 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, Hi, this is uh, Matt from North Carolina. It's, it's, I'm sorry, what's your name? Matt. Matt from North Carolina. What's up, Matt? Yeah. Um, So I've heard you, uh, you know, debate several uh, libertarians on your show, and it's not a philosophy I subscribe to. Hmm. But um, recently, I've seen a an interesting argument regarding the uh, the post office that I'd like to hear your take on. Again, okay. this is not something I subscribe to. I feel like the post office is a greater public good um, that should be kept. But again, I just wanted to run this. Uh, all right. Argument, I'm happy to engage in this, although I am extremely disappointed that you are, in fact, not a libertarian. But go ahead, Matt. Just speak <laughs> up a little bit. OK, so. With regards to the post offices, post, whatever, monopoly on um, first class mail. Um, basically. That drives the junk mail industry in the in the country. Yeah, and the direct mail industry does damage to the American poor through you know the, the uh, just basically some of the scams of like you know uh, re up the warranty on your car. Okay. Uh, massive APR credit cards. Okay, you know I get it. I get it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and, and if if that monopoly were ended, the junk mail industry would uh, basically fall apart due to you know not and no longer being subsidized by a low mailing rate. So their, their their return on investment would lower enough that they would I see. naturally go out of business. Yeah. Um, and given that roughly you know 
uh, I don't remember the exact number, but over half of the mail, first class mail, sent is junk mail. Most of that ends up in the uh, garbage. In the garbage. And a very small percentage of that is recycled so that on top of. Right. Okay. So, okay, I get you. It would, so, it would be a greater economic impact as well and, and, and whatnot. Okay. All right. So, the, Matt, let me, let me, let me, let me, uh, let me, let me just uh, recapitulate your uh, argument and uh, just make sure I got it. So, uh, the problem that privatizing the um, uh, Postal Service or I guess making it not a monopoly, but it's not a monopoly in the sense that, like, I mean, I, I you know, I, 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 FedEx could certainly have a product that would compete for it, but it's too expensive. Um, I mean, the the post office, for the most part, has been self-sufficient. If they had the ability to raise the prices um, on their stamps, they, they would, and they would be, uh, you know, far more solvent uh, than they are now. They also have obligations that we've talked to in the past uh, about funding their pension. So I'm not quite convinced that the problem... I don't I don't know that the problem could be solved by breaking up their monopoly because frankly they don't have a monopoly on first class mail uh, FedEx could do it but they just don't want, don't to. want to. Yeah. Um but let's just uh, uh, let me just stipulate that okay they have a monopoly and the argument is is that we are subsidizing junk mail because um I'm not sure exactly. I, I, I mean, junk mail exists because the Postal Service is so efficient and can afford to send their mail everywhere at a cheaper rate that makes it worthwhile to junk mail. But the fact is, is like the post office, we other than this bailout that it needs right now, we're not subsidizing any more than we were subsidizing GM when it needed its bailout. Uh, and we gave it to them. We've done for other companies or we've done for farmers right now. Um, but if that is really the problem that we're trying to solve, junk mail, there is a way to do that. And that is um, just pass a regulation that there's no junk mail and allow the Postal Service to raise the prices. Because on some level, the junk mail is subsidizing other people's letters uh, because it's funding the post office. But if you want to get rid of junk mail and you're concerned about it, I think, you know, I don't like junk mail. Um, you could just simply have the post office say, we're not going to do junk mail anymore, but we're going to raise the cost of, of a stamp to a dollar or but, 75 cents or whatever it is. So I, I don't. There's, I don't there's another aspect, though, too, of that political mail, a huge industry and how yep. that affects democracy. And uh, I was talking to a consultant just yesterday, a general consultant for campaigns, and they were very concerned about whether or not they were going to be able to send out their political mail, which is a big part of a campaign, grassroots or not, um, because you have to time it right. You have to, you know, you have to have enough time to be able to mail it out, and it usually happens last minute and fast, and they rely on the Postal Service specifically because they know how to pace out that mail so that they can send it four days in advance. They can have the design done, boom, send, right. and it's in the mailbox like three days before the election. Right. The idea of destroying a universal postal service for the sake of ending junk mail uh, doesn't, uh, it seems like a very um, roundabout way of dealing with that problem. Yeah. Sounds like some Chuck Schumer might be interested in though. Yeah. We got to talk to the Baileys. Appreciate the call, Matt. Interesting. Thank you. Um, all right. Let's do, um, what should we do here? Which clip here? Should we do? Um, I think we should do eight. So many. Or 14. Eight or 14. Okay. Or nine or 14, excuse me. Oh, we did do eight and or nine or 14. Right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, the student one? Okay. Well, let's do both. Both. Uh, here's number nine. This is Donald Trump. He is uh, on the stump in uh, Mankato, Minnesota. And... Mankato. Mankato, excuse me. Mankato, Minnesota. And just trying to remind people we can bring back some of that good old magic. People with diplomas, people without diplomas, Ooh. college students, crummy students, great students, horrible students, what? dumb people, liberal what? people, what? conservative people. Everybody was doing the best they've ever done. PhDs from MIT, 
PhDs from crummy colleges. <laughs> Everybody was doing the greatest, the best they've ever done. Me yeah, there he is. He's enjoying it. He's feeling. Is he best. talking about before coronavirus? Hit? Yeah, he's talking yeah. about before coronavirus. The economy he's was out the there. best ever. Having before fun. I Remember when he said that? Like dumb people. I don't mind dumb people. Uh, he's he really I can manipulate them. he really likes going out and 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 it has hurt him i think his campaign not being able to go out and have live yeah. audiences he's a road comic who self-identifies as dumb like do dumb dumb people don't necessarily say you know i'm a dummy i think what that does again is it basically puts you on the inside it gets you within the the um the, you know, the circle of trust that they tell you when they right. teach you media relations. When you start saying that people are dumb, if I say, like, if I start talking to, about dumb people to you, the implication is I don't think you're dumb. Right. And They're, now oh, you're on the inside. And people. now, goes, and now people, we're ta- people. Right. And we're talking about other people. Yeah. We're talking about other people. That's what happens, I think, in your mind when someone says that to you. Hmm. That's really like like uh, that, that. That's been my experience. Uh, that I have a, a friend, um, uh, John Benjamin, who is very rude to people, um, and <laughs> but is so rude to people that they find it funny, and then they uh, they actually really like him because of it. Whereas, like, I am just rude enough to people where it's like, oh, uh, you you think I like you? Oh, well, let me make it clear that I don't like you. But he's more likable because of that. And I think that's what Trump's got going. Like, he could be saying, like, you know, looking at, like, there could be dumb people here. But everybody's looking around going, like, it's not me. Yeah. I'm with him. And I think that's what's, I think that's what the dynamic is with that. I think that's why he gets away with that. And, of course, look, I mean, the, uh, the other reality is, is that everybody looks around at that thing. And they're looking at people who look exactly like them. Mm-hmm. There's not a huge diversity um, of people when he lands and he's out at that airport. I mean, you tell me the town and I'll tell you what the audience looks like. That's there, you know, like maybe they're all wearing baseball caps and, you know, and he goes into Iowa, everybody who shows up at that event are um, guys wearing white guys wearing baseball caps. I mean, that that's it. Bottom line. I mean, looking around like I'm not, if I'm not the dummy, nobody else here is the dummy. We're talking about other people. That's what's going on there. I think. It's interesting. I wonder where he, yeah, uh, I, I, I love the the stories of early Trump because that's not anything, I, I still don't really understand how he's been able to speak to, to populations that are so outside of the population that he grew up and around. He, it, it, look it at, look at what a magnificent he's been selling. transformation. He's been no, selling he's been schlock. S- yes. He's been selling schlock for since Since decades. The Apprentice. Since The Apprentice, he's been selling it to a wider yep. audience, but not prior. That's not really his upper. It's, it's magnificent to see the transformation into Trump the populist versus Trump the New York real estate developer who, who clashed with everybody. Well, you know, and hung, I, I, I don't think there's as much of a dynamic. I don't think there's as much. I think like, you know, look, you can sell. Uh, you learn to sell schlock. You can sell schlock. That's basically <laughs> it. Here is... Um, this is a clip from the Alex Morse Richie Neal debate. I've yeah. I've watched about half of this debate. I haven't seen it. Yet. I thought I thought Morse did okay actually, um, at least in the first half. Uh, and Richie Neal really was on the defensive about this thing, and he kept saying like, "There's going to be an open investigation," but I just want to make it clear: I had nothing to do with this. I had absolutely nothing to do with this. Um, and I don't know. I thought Morse did pretty good job in this, um, but. Quick question before him. Is this where you're from in Massachusetts? Is, is no, this, this is Western, Western Mass. Now, Richie Neal okay. is from Worcester. Okay. But no, Jim McGovern's my, uh, well, he's not my congressman, but uh, he's, the, he's the congressman from the town I grew Foreman. up in. Okay. So this is the district uh, to the left. Got it. Not, not ideologically. Fundamental question of this campaign, and I think I've already laid out tonight the specific ways in which Congressman Neal is using his power. And I'm not contesting that, but he's using his power for the wealthy, the well-connected, and the corporations that have invested millions of dollars into his campaign. And I would argue in Washington right now, it's not those members of Congress that have been there for 30 or 40 years that are changing the agenda for the Democratic Party or changing the agenda for our country. It's even those members of Congress that have been there less than two years. The day of pork and earmarks are over. 
COPS grants for police departments, safer grants for fire departments, even the money being allocated in, in the CARES Act. That money won't go away. But we need to back up a moment. Congressman Neal just doesn't understand the urgency of the moment. He's been there 30 years. A tax credit here, a tax credit there, a small grant here, a small grant there. We need to actually meet the urgency of the moment. If the CARES Act was so wonderful and successful, why is it we have to rush back to Washington because it wasn't big enough? Because families are still going hungry and losing their homes. And that was happening even before this pandemic. I mean, I chatted with a constituent just four days ago is paying $475 for a COVID-19 test. Millions That's of Americans silly. have lost their job and now their health insurance. And we still have a congressman in the middle of this pandemic that is using his power to subsidize the private health care industry that still can't grasp why health care should be a fundamental human right. And so, yes, he has power. But we need to make sure that we build power together to change lives here in Springfield and across the district. Congressman Neal. Thanks, right. I mean, that's uh, pretty well stated. I mean, I don't think Morse is as, you know, I don't think he's as progressive as some of the others in the uh, the squad necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think we'll I think, you know, if he gets into office, time will tell. But I think he's definitely an upgrade from Richie Neal. And I will say this. That uh, is a Doggett that would take over on the Ways and Means. I think he's got in seniority. It will be significant upgrade on Ways and Means. And this is the type of stuff. Like, we knock off some of this leadership. This makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. He takes, what, more money, more corporate money, more corporate PAC money than the any lawmaker in Washington? Democrat or Republican, yes. It's insane. Yes. That and is And that came out. Morris hit him with that blowing. at the beginning. Yep, that is mind blowing. And so I think one that... one really quick fact on 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 um, so this whole leak that that came out about the coordination between the YDA, uh, young Democrats, uh, advisor, whatever you want to call him, um, like he was official or not, who knows? The 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 memo that was leaked uh, involved this man named James Roosevelt. James Roosevelt is the grandson of FDR. James Roosevelt is known as the fixer at the DNC. He's not just a DNC member. I have seen so many reporters say, oh, he's a DNC member. No, 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 no. This is the DNC member who's always on the Rules Committee, who knows exactly how to work the rules, who's on the Unity Reform Commission with us, who's on my committee about budget and finances, a committee of four people with Jim Zogby. Uh, this is somebody who does not see the spotlight ever. Nobody ever looks into him. He is a lawyer, so there's a lot of protection around what he is able to disclose because as, a, as an attorney, you don't necessarily right. have to disclose your client's information. Um, and so this is this was a huge, I mean, that to me was something profound that was exposed. Uh, he's from Massachusetts, so that's why he's involved with the Massachusetts Democratic Party. These are the tricks that the Democratic Party pulls. And I'm really happy that for once, uh, what happened between Morse and Neal and and this type of potential sabotage internally was exposed. These dirty tricks happen, though, all the time. I know of three cases right now, uh, one with Isan Lakey, same exact situation in which um, people are are found in FEC filings as early employers. They're reached out by some sort of consultant or conduit uh, to essentially try to, to sabotage progressive campaigns. And I think that folks, if you're watching, be on the lookout for this and don't fall for it all the time. You have to ask the right questions. You have to ask for, ask for specifics. You have to actually look at the, 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 the documents because if this memo had not been leaked, my guess is Morris would be in a very different situation right now. And we've seen a lot of Democrats uh, go after progressives in similar ways that lack specifics and that are based on rumors. And um, yep. If you do yep. know of this kind of stuff, leak it out because this is how they get uncovered. Uh, Dirty and, tricks. And I, I listen. I will tell you that um, when we say that on this program, and there are people who are hearing my voice if they're listening right now, know that you send us stuff, we act upon it. Yes. That may not happen here, but um, some of the information that is wound up in some of this reporting came from our listeners. Oof. So I'm not going to say any more about that, but um, it was one of those things where you, you, it makes you feel like, Oh, I'm glad we do this show. Uh, uh, sort of a bank shot, but uh, very helpful. All right, let's do a bunch of IMs and then we'll get out of here. Uh, teacher Dan, 
The Democrats, as in the establishment of the party, are paid to not excite the working class. The convention will be a Trump bad, Joe good, can't, Kamala Palooza. <laughs> be inspired, just don't expect anything. T-shirts coming. Yeah, I, I mean, I think- that's... I was just going to say, I want a T-shirt. <laughs> Z Brooks, she was on Modern Family. So yeah, there you go. Uh, when? I don't know. Oh, like um, one episode? Yeah, I think like... I, 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 mean, I think I know that because I looked it up, but it said she's on Modern Family. I don't know. Uh, Gregory, the young blood wrote that song, not Crosby, Stills and Nash. Right. No, it wasn't. It was the Buffalo Smoke. All right. The DNC doesn't feel leftist. They loathe them. Correct. Reading that the St. Louis McMansion couple who drew guns on the BLM marches will be speaking at the GOP convention. Yep. Did you know that? I When I read it, I thought it said the DNC. And I was like, of course. I literally, that's, no, but that's how bad it was <laughs> and yesterday. And also, the kid, <laughs> the kid who, um, the kid who, uh, um, you know, the Covington Catholic kid that Covington, got in the face of the Native yeah. American. Oh, the Native American, yeah. yeah. That, Who's yeah. suing everybody? Yep. All right. Yeah. One more uh, One more phone call, and then I'll do a couple IMs, and then we're out of it. Last phone call. Call from an 801 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Oh, hell yeah. Let's, let's go. Samuel, what's up? What's up? Samuel. Shit. Um, I just wanted to say. Who's uh, this? I need to call you out on something real quick. Who is it? Oh, this is Gabriel from Salt Lake, my bad. Okay. Uh, what's up, Gabriel? What's on your mind? So you've been kind of tiptoeing around when people bring up all these hacks on the so- so-called left, like Crystal Ball. Uh, I think Kyle Kalinske's in that conversation, and also mm-hmm. Matt Taibbi. Like, they're kind of just clowns, and you're down dancing around it. Like, why don't you call them out on their <laughs> shit? I mean, i got to be honest with you. Um, Taibbi, I, did, I did, you know, look, I – I have been, I have, I have, there's been specific things that he's done that I've had a problem with that I've said, Uh, you know, um, I I think the idea of like comparing what they call Russia gate to uh, the Iraq war in terms of like the implications of that coverage, I think is ridiculous. I mean, and uh, I think he was narrowly slicing things. Um, And to be honest with you, I mean, I addressed the one thing that I've heard Kyle say, which was uh, I'm not going to vote for Joe Biden unless he gives us health care. I think that's I think that's silly. Um, I mean, I think it's I think it's just silly. I don't think it I don't think it's effective. I don't understand the strategy behind it. And I think, you know, certainly in September, it's something that I would entertain, like maybe having him on to, d- to discuss it, because I'd be curious about that. I, I'm not lying. I don't follow what crystal does i think she's a nice person i like her uh but you know um i it's just not well i mean look i i I, I honestly i i I just don't follow it i mean the reason why i got such a bee in my bonnet about jimmy Dore was because not only did he say something really stupid and you know the way that 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 basically came from that time that he uh, somebody sent me a clip where he and on his show and his uh, co-host said, you know, if Peter Thiel becomes uh, a Supreme Court justice, whatever, we'll get over it. And where they were saying just like I can't remember, it was all sorts of nonsense. I told Jimmy because I considered him, you know, I'm not fr- hanging out with him, but I I I sent him an email that night and I said, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this clip that somebody sent me of yours. And if you want to come on the show to talk about it, you know, I'd ha- happy to have you on. And he said, no, no, go ahead. Don't, you don't need me. And I was like, okay. And so I started talking about it. Apparently he was listening to the show. Um, and he called in a little bitch. And I, I, I wouldn't uh, characterize it that way. Cause I don't like how gendered that is. But uh, I would say that, yes, oh, well, he we acted, all know how bad Jimmy Dore is. Yes. And, and that's why, like, you know, that that be in my bonnet. And, and then, of course, he went on to say stuff like Hillary's got Parkinson's and Seth Rich. We should be looking into it. it's red flaggy and stuff like that. Matt Taibbi is half the Dave Rubin is on like he's going to be a conservative in two years. I guarantee. Well, it. I mean, look, I don't know about you that. go and look at his. I don't know if he's going to do that, but you go look into his YouTube comments. He's already floated the idea of voting for Trump over Biden. He said, I would rather you like he's literally said that on his show. I've heard him say that. So he's on the same trajectory well, that Dave Rubin. I would like need to see ago. a clip of that. But if you send me it, I will talk about it. But I mean, if you go into I his bet. YouTube comments. You can look in there and you get a sense of who his audience is. And and that's exactly. you know, uh, that gives you a sense of like, you know, 
what he's saying on a regular basis. But to be honest with you, like, I don't know, I, you know, if somebody sends me a clip of, uh, of something that Crystal says that I think is ridiculous, I will, I will, uh, I will talk about it. All right, I'm going to send you a clip because all she does is kiss Sauger's ass on that show. Well, honestly. I don't care about so, Sauger. Like, I don't. So juvenile. I don't care about that. Listen, I, my only concern I about these the folks call, is Gabriel. when they're a slippery slope to the, to the Rubens. When there's, there's a bridge and it goes from Sam Cedar to Jimmy Dore to Ruben because that's what concerns me. I don't think that Crystal, I mean, listen, Crystal works for a company. I know Crystal personally, so I'll defend her. She's, she's, she's a progressive. She's anti-establishment personally. Um, she's, you know, been involved well before her show. She is on a platform. Excuse me, there's something happening outside. <laughs> she is on a platform that is corporate. And so she's operating within the limitations of, of a platform, The Hill, that is Republican-owned, and there's a Republican on the show. And so I think given the circumstances, just as, as, as Chris Say is given the circumstances of MSNBC, she's doing a decent job. And so yeah, we just I have mean, to keep that in mind. I think, I think look, you know, the bottom line is is that, and, and I... I, I I'm not endorsing that uh, uh, your perception because I, I just don't follow on the show. Like, you know, I, I've been on the show once or twice and I think it was like to talk about impeachment. And I think there is a, there is, there's a couple of different strains of, 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 of things that are happening. One is anti-establishment that is divorced from any type of like leftist critique and uh, is divorced from any perspective on, you know, really material benefits for people like, you know, anti-establishment for the sake of being against the establishment. I, the, the, the issue I have with the establishment and in and my, my sense is usually like, you know, the new establishment's going to be as bad as the old establishment in terms of sharing power. It's really a question of, of what they're doing with that power and at whose behalf they're working. Because I don't think that there is a, there is any, entity or institution that exists where somebody gets in power that they're like, Oh, I'm going to let the young upstarts take the power from me. That never happens, but you can have an establishment that is doing good things. Theoretically. The problem is, is that our, our current establishments in this environment are dominated by big moneyed interests that do that, that see the vast majority of the population as basically, you know, uh, like uh, things from the matrix that they're sucking, you know, basically just extracting, you know, things to extract from and to exploit their labor and whatnot. Um, they're unwilling to take a, a critical, you know, analysis of how these institutions work. It's, it's, listen, there's a major difference between a police union and the nurses union. They're both institutions. They operate very differently some are, you know, one is more democratic than the other, but we have to be very, understand how these institutions function, who makes them up, what oversight there is. And, but, you know, but, if you're not willing to do that work, then uh, you're going to get the clicks probably. But I also think that there is like, there are constraints when you are working for somebody else, there are constraints. And the trade-off is, you know, like, I mean, I think, you know, people, uh, people can guess when I, when I do, when I filled in for, for Hayes on that Friday night, it was really more for, for, for fun than anything else, but it did give me, you know, and I thought that I was going to have Bernie on, but, uh, I was able to, to get, uh, Corey Bush on for instance and stuff. And, and so there's a little bit of a trade-off. Yeah. There are guests that are available that I'm not necessarily huge, su super fond of. Like Barbara and Boxer. That was amazing. <laughs> Uh, like, you Sam. said that. You said that. I didn't say that. People can <laughs> go back and look at my previous, um, uh, you know, appearances with her as we're both guests. But this is what they're offered. We had a cancellation, whatnot, and this and that, and and this is the way it works. There is always a trade-off to get into a position where you have a bigger platform if you're going to be hired by somebody else. I mean, there's a trade-off to the extent, like you know, the fact is, is that. This show could be bigger if we reverse the interview with the fun half. Yeah. I mean, like, I've been told that multiple times. I know that. I know that as somebody who develops shows. But it's a trade-off. I want to promote these, these things, and it makes it interesting for me, and I want to make, you know, a guest who comes on to have access to that audience. Um, you know, YouTube has changed the dynamic a little, but there's always trade-offs in those things. 
I, I'm not saying that's necessarily the, the what's going on with um, with 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 Crystal, but that that dynamic is is real. Um, and you know, Taibbi has opinions that I disagree with. Jimmy Dore is just not bright. Like Michael Tracy and Jimmy Dore are sort of more. Uh, I, I have more associations with 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 those two than I do with Taibbi. Well, I think that's, that's just, where it's like it's a personal, like it's their personal motivations. It's their per- It's not about clicks in some cases. I think with Taibbi, he has been a victim of 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 an onslaught of attacks in which it's really hard for him to separate maybe his personal issues and I think having worked in Russia to that too. with that. And and I think sometimes with Glenn Greenwald too, who I respect and admire, you know, you're you be, it's a, it's a form of Stockholm syndrome. Like they don't know another way. Because you get you, you get stuck into these fights as as the, as the victim um, for so long, but with Michael Tracy, I think that's like a yeah, personality but defect. A, a crucial difference is like Taibbi and Greenwald, especially like it's not just they don't just have takes all day like Dor does. They do they have a body of work that they can point right. to. Right. right, exactly. They have a body of work, and they will actually engage in debate. Mm-hmm. Right. Show me the the somebody send me a clip of Jimmy Dore having anybody question his stuff. And allowing that to happen publicly. I don't think it exists. I honestly don't. And, you know, you can sit there and uh, talk about how, um, uh, you know, I know he's just considers himself a jag off comedian or whatever it is. But, you know, if you really are that convicted about your beliefs, then you should welcome a challenge to them. But no, he lied to me about having me back on a show. He made up a whole story. It was pretty sad. It was really sad. Uh, all right. Five of these IMs are out here. Colorado guy with Republican approval. Trump still at 90 percent. What is the best argument you can assign to Democrats for committing so much time and energy at trying to win over conservatives? I think this uh, convention solidifies that establishment Democrats aren't that interested in a left coalition for as long as they hold power. I, I think you're putting too much weight on the convention itself as like being exemplary of that. I mean, what you're saying may be true, but I don't think the convention is the, uh, the proof of that. I think there is a sense that they can swing white suburban women who went for Donald Trump in uh, 2016. And they, they think they can do it this time. And I think that's what that's about. I don't personally think that that's where they should be spending their resources or, or looking for voters. But I also think, that, you know, one of the problems with having Joe Biden as the nominee is that there's people around him who will basically say that those are the people you want because they're not just looking. And, and Hillary Clinton did this, and this was underreported, I think. They are looking to win with a specific coalition because of what they want to have built in parameters for what legislation That's right. will That's go right. forward and what their expectations are. If they win with everybody on the left, there's going to be, they're going to owe the left. They know this. And that's why, you know, that's what's so dangerous about the the Lincoln Project. Because the Lincoln Project is making, their ad campaign is as much about convincing Joe Biden that Joe Biden won because of the help from the Lincoln Project as it is in actually helping Joe Biden win. And they want, It's not going to be an explicit seat at the table and it may be just for those people themselves, but that's what that's about. I mean, and so, but I don't know. And and it's a much harder feat because they're basically trying to build this crazy coalition rather than just focusing on getting people who make under $50,000 a year to turn out at the rates that they used to turn out like 10 years ago. Right. Well, that's it. 2008 is always going to be tough to replicate uh, on, on some level, but, but the fact is, is that, that's what it means to have Joe Biden win as opposed to Bernie Sanders. Mm-hmm. That's what it means. And I think people are leaning on the convention because of 2016. For for those who like just tuned in in 2016, that's like the only convention that's really mattered in the last 50 years. Yep. Binder dad. Sam, for what it's worth, is Buffalo Springfield. Yes, I know. Sorry. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I just, I just, I just misspoke. Believe me, I've been there. I know it. I know it. I got that album. I still have that album. Wow. Silver Ball Stud, one positive. We heard stories from working people, uh, more working people than last time. Yes, we did. We really did. I mean, they, 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 they mixed in some of that last night. 
Yeah. Uh, Jack Welch, thank you, countryman. Uh, Kyle Marx, Biden, and the DNC are literally using the same strategy Hillary used in 2016. Trump bad, Biden good. Didn't work then. It's not going to work now. I honestly don't think they even want to win Kyle Marx uh, 2024. I will say this. The one deficit that Biden doesn't have that Hillary had is that, well, two uh, multiple ones. Uh, one, they have not been able to tag a corrupt frame on him. Uh, remember, the issue wasn't the problem with Hillary losing was not that they had made the case that Trump was that 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 the case that Trump was bad failed. It's that there was too many people who were open to the fact that Hillary wasn't good. That's right. And they have not succeeded in doing that with Biden, partly because there isn't this sort of like cottage industry that's existed for 30 years that to, to make the move to say that uh, Clinton's corrupt. I mean, Clinton being corrupt relative to what the right was primed for over since, you know, 93 was actually sort of tame because in 93, they still had her murdering Vince Foster. And, you know, so they, they were backing off the idea that you could buy that she's corrupt. She was she murdered Vince Foster. I mean, of course, she's corrupt. Um, and the other thing is, is that Joe Biden is a guy. And if, if people don't think, like I say, there's a dozen but fours. But if people don't think that uh, misogyny's not worth uh, 11,000 votes in Michigan and uh, 20 or 11,000 votes in Wisconsin, 20,000 votes in Detroit, maybe 40,000 in, in in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I got a country and, to and, introduce. And you those to. women, those women, the, the 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 suburban whatever you want to call them, like uh, middle aged women, upper middle aged women, they traditionally vote the ones that they're looking at. Traditionally vote with their partners, their male partners. So if your male partner. Is, is buying the Hillary thing. You know, I think yep. that Hillary took a bet thinking she could she could really, and she even had some of these people on stage. She thought they could cleave the yes. spouse from the husband, not the case. It's a uh, weird dynamic. Rick McHurin, the dinosaur Dems will elect Biden and then as, uh, assume the problems are over, just like when Obama replaced Bush, never addressing the underlying issues. Well, I think, like, look, it, we, we cannot leave it to them to do that. That's the the problem. Is that we all like to? Uh, oh, you got to go on. Okay. Oh, jeez, <laughs> folks. Wait. Uh, Nomi's got a, a show. To do. <laughs> Nomi's got a show to do in three minutes. So uh, I have to take a bathroom break first. <laughs> check it out. Um, check out Nomi's show. Nomi, thanks for being on today. Sorry <laughs> to, uh, for... to run into wait, your show. Wait, can we do the pass off? So, so you're you're Chris Hayes, and I'm I'm uh, Rachel Maddow. <laughs> Brendan, Matt, thank you very much. Uh, next up on uh, YouTube, uh, Nomi Const. Uh, Nomi, have a good show. Thank you, Sam. I'm I'm looking forward to having John Nichols at the top. But first, I have to go take a bathroom break. So stick around. You might have that screen on for a little bit. <laughs> All right. We'll see you uh, later. Have a good show. Thanks, guys. Take care. All right. Bye, guys. See you tomorrow. <laughs> the Matt Nichols Rebecca to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm going to get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are going to kick 